All, most of you or many of you are with this community organizing program here in, in England. I don't know much about your program. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about what I know about and try to see how it applies to what you're doing. I read uh, some of the training materials you've been through, so uh, I've got a rough familiarity with some of what you're taught and not taught, but basically uh, you're going to have to explain to me uh, where what I'm talking about fits into what you're trying to do and where it doesn't. What's good for me, if, if we take a minute to say who y'all are, if we go around the room and people say what their name is, this is not an AA program, you can actually say your last name, because um, it you know, helps you remember and where you're working. Uh, Usually I say where you're from, but I guess a lot of people are not from where they're working, or I'm not sure. But so I'm from New Orleans. You, you will have some problems in English to English translation, um, which means I probably won't understand some of what you say. I've lived in uh, New Orleans off and on for a number of years, and the more years I live there, the more southern, you know, it's a y'all thing. So actually, people from New Orleans and from the South do not talk like I do. Um, but you mix all that sort of Wyoming and New Orleans together, and this is what you get. So I don't know where your accent comes from, but when you don't understand me, just ask me to repeat it. When I don't understand you, you'll just see a deer in a headlight look like, you know, and somebody just help out and put it into English. But, you know, American English and translate, and you'll just do that. Okay, you want to start? Um, hello, I'm Letty Anderson. So, if anybody uh, knows a lot about cameras, we have a camera that's also taping much of this session just so we can put it on YouTube so that you can look at it later, so that we can look at it later, use it in training elsewhere. Um, you're looking for volunteers if anybody's enthusiastic yeah, about getting special shots or whatever. So, here's what we're going to try to do today. Here's my experience. I started as an organizer in the United States, dropped out of school at 19 to organize first with a group called the National Welfare Rights Organization. In the United States in the late 60s, there were a number of movements that came at the same time as the anti-war movement. Hey, how are you? Well, and who are you? Caroline. And where do you work, Caroline? I work for Community Housing Okay, so now you just, you're even with everybody. We just finished introducing ourselves. <laughs> Sorry, no, a special performance is always appreciated. So I, I started working in Springfield, Massachusetts, in the New England part of the United States, organizing Mothers on Welfare. It's a program called AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children. We used to have welfare in the old days that actually, if you were a mother with children, you got support from the United States to try to raise your family. We don't have quite that level of support anymore over the last 45 years, but that's what it was then. And National Welfare Rights was started by a former uh, civil rights leader named Dr. George Wiley, who had been uh, the number two person at the Congress of Racial Equality Corps, which is one of the SNCC, Corps, NAACP, for any of you familiar at all with the U.S. Civil Rights Movement. Uh, these were part of the organizations that helped drive that change along with the SCLC, which is where uh, Dr. King worked. So this organization was based on trying to establish that welfare, in fact, was a right, welfare rights organization. Uh, it was what the name says. I left uh, there in Massachusetts. I went from Springfield to Boston, where I then ran. This was the largest of the welfare rights organizations. The advantage of being 20 years old, for all of you who are closer to 20, is luckily at 20 years old, 21 years old, which is how old I was when I started ACORN, at 21 you pretty much know everything. Yep. <laughs> and it's only later that it turns out, you know, that the learning curve is more difficult. But after a year with welfare rights, I was convinced that there were some things we were doing that were very right and there were some things that weren't working. What we were doing right is mobilizing welfare recipients successfully for change. We were winning millions of dollars in benefits on what were called special needs. So if people needed furniture, we would make demands for furniture. If we, they needed winter clothing for adults or children or school clothing or Easter clothing, we won various campaigns in Massachusetts. It was at that point a liberal welfare state, which meant you could push very hard, you could sit in and 
welfare offices in Boston, Springfield, Worcester, across the state. And every once in a while you could win. And it was a time in which uh, the tactics were uh, coming out of the civil rights movement were different than they might be now. So in the year that I ran mass welfare rights, we had some 474 arrests of organizers and welfare recipients in these offices putting pressure on, on the system. What happened is we were almost too successful, so the more we demanded special needs, finally the Republican governor at that point proposed a flat grant, which meant no special needs, everybody raised up to a certain level for a family of four. Well, in public policy terms, this is probably a win. It means everybody got more money in the state. In organizing terms, because we built a membership of 5,000 welfare recipient families based on winning special needs, it took away the primary organizing tool. The other problem, Massachusetts was a more high-income state. So if I was door knocking door to door in a housing project, I might talk to you and you about welfare, and then all of a sudden you're making $100 more a year, I can't talk to you. You the same thing, maybe you're getting food stamps. So we were dividing the low-income community where some people had the same issues <coughs> in schools or in housing with that housing authority or what you call uh, social housing or whatever. But technically weren't and weren't able to be members of the welfare rights organization because they weren't on welfare. So in uh, 1970, welfare rights was trying to expand to the southern part of the United States because they were trying to win a this flat grant I talked about in Massachusetts, what they called adequate income for all. And there were two political players that were both, because of seniority in the U.S. Congress, were located in the South. One was in Arkansas, Congressman Wilbur Mills, who was the head of the Ways and Means Committee, and the other was in Louisiana, Senator Russell Long, who was the head of the Finance Committee. So having gone to high school in the South, I didn't have any particular prejudice against the South. I went to high school in New Orleans. Um, high school was, let's see, these are publicly funded school, or secondary school, I don't know, mm -hmm. is that what you call them? Yeah. Okay. State school. Huh? State school. State school. I went to state school. Yeah. Um, state school is usually a reform school where you get after you're thrown out of high school in the U.S. So it's always good to know. Really, I barely kept out of state school in the U.S. Um, and my career actually explains that. But, uh, so he needed something on a southern strategy. I had this idea for something that would be a broader organization of low and moderate income families <coughs> that wouldn't divide just welfare recipients. That would be multi-issued, not just welfare, but issues that were broader throughout the constituency. That would be multiracial. That would be statewide, et cetera. I had this idea for an organization called ACORN. And uh, because they needed somebody to go to the South, and I was going to go to the South, the deal I made is if you support me starting ACORN, here I go. I've never been to this state called Arkansas in my life. Arkansas, there's, there are a lot of pigs in Arkansas, too. I tell you, that's a rural state. Um, but the advantages to starting something like ACORN in Arkansas, if you're trying to build a statewide organization, trying to build an organizing model, is the largest city and the capital city were the same which is actually not true in every one of the United States, uh, the states of the United States. It was very centrally located in the state, which meant that if you started in Little Rock, which was a large city in the capital, you could branch out to the other cities very easily within a two and a half hour drive to organize a statewide organization. 35% um, of the population was African American, 65% of it was uh, at that point white. Now there's a very uh, extensive uh, Latino population in Arkansas. And for my money, 70% of the people made less than $7,000 a year, um, which was more money than it is today, 45 years later, still no money, really. Um, so in a Massachusetts where a school lunch program, getting lunches at school for free or reduced price was essentially a welfare benefit, in Arkansas, virtually every public school or state school, thank you, state school person qualified for school lunches because everybody was dirt poor. Trying to build an Do you think that the ACORN model would have been as effective as the original Linsky model in the slums and getting the wages and everything right from the, it was the issues that they were aiming for? Do you think it would have been as effective? Or do you think perhaps he was getting it right? 
Do I time. think the ACORN model would have been as effective as what now? The NXC model, because you know, you started it for the particular reason. Well, obviously, I didn't think the Alinsky model was effective when I started ACORN in 1970 because the Alinsky model uh, presumed there were. The Alinsky model built, built together, you know, sort of trying to amalgamate organizations together to act, but you had to have real organizations. In many places, particularly where I was starting ACORN, there weren't organizations at all. So it was more a fabrication to try to say you a people's organization of all the organizations, if you were having to sort of breathe life into something to pretend it was an organization, it really couldn't add much power or strength. Mm -hmm. So the reason, I mean, but I understood the model. I mean, Alinsky was trying to legitimize it, and it's hard to separate the roots of the Alinsky model from Chicago. Yes. And that's why it hasn't traveled as well around the world. Chicago was, the Alinsky model was aggressively apolitical. It was based on a presumption that organizers, once they built it, were gone in three years. It was about building a car and not caring where it, where it was driven. So that many of the early Alinsky organizations, Back of the Yards was the most famous, actually became a right-wing organization keeping integration, keeping African Americans from moving into the neighborhood. Well, that didn't work for me. Um, I don't pretend not to have any politics. I wasn't, I'm just... I'm not a mechanic. I actually care where the car goes. I mean, it's not just building a car and just, you know, let's hope for the best. Um, so I wanted a democratic organization that would tend to be progressive because that's what people tend to believe in in those changes and would be able to sustain itself in that way. And the Alinsky model was built to avoid politics because the machine in Chicago under, under uh, Richard Daley was so powerful politically but they would essentially walk away on election day and let the machine do whatever it was going to do with their people. And my view is you can't build power that way. The argument, um, the Alinsky, what Saul used to say is, you know, power is numbers. If you have enough numbers, more people, more poor people and rich people. And, you know, if that were true, we'd be more powerful today than we ever have been because there are so many more of us than, you know, 99% or whatever. There's so many more of us than there are of them, but somehow, I'm not getting the fact that we're more powerful. I don't know about here, but I know in the United States we're, we're actually losing, not winning. Um, so, no, I think, you know, we deliberately did some things that were much different in terms of uh, empowering the membership and whatever. Um, so I don't think it would have been different. I think... The reason that the Alinsky model changed into a faith-based model, really, and, you know, I, I don't want to give you the ending of the story here in the first hour, and we're going to be together, but it had to do with resources. Um, they couldn't raise enough money to support the organizational model they were trying to raise, so they had to make it an appendage of existing organizations that had resources that would fund them. And we bet the other way. If people weren't willing to support us, we're not sure we should survive, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so if that's the advantage of a dues system. The dues, uh, between 1970 and 1985, dues probably contributed 70% of the income for ACORN. Uh, as the organization got bigger, it probably got more towards 25 or 30%, but that was still the, the foundation point of the organization is what those members paid, what their dues were, what their votes were, and a lot of the rest of the activities that were housing related or our unions or whatever were all sort of related to that fundamental base. I say all that to say this. You, we, everybody has a copy of the agenda in front of them, so every once in a while pull me back if I'm not there. But essentially, this is where I come from. Where you come from, you're going to have to explain to me um, as we go along. But what I'm hoping is valuable, and anytime anybody wants to ask a question, raise your hand as you just saw. Just a second. <laughs> come on. I got, I got my eye on you. From the beginning, from the Katrina point. I told you, I'm watching you now. Um, she asked me, oh. People still live in New Orleans? Not exactly like that. <laughs> it was close. It was close. Not as bad as, you know, I'm now creative, I'm not an organizer, but it was close. I'm not, not keeping a catalog of some of these, you know, slaps down, but whatever. Regardless, my point of view is 
because you're all at different levels trying to organize in some way, shape, or form, even if you never do a thing I'm talking about, it at least shows you what's possible and as a frame of reference to look at what organizational experience is and what might be something that could be assembled here with your work and with others. Phoenix? Can I just ask you to very briefly explain the Alinsky model again because I haven't quite got the... It was... Uh, there's an expression in Texas about the Texas Rangers who are the sort of state police, one ranger, one riot. So it was a belief in the supremacy of the organizer. You had one or two organizers for an entire community. That organizer's job <coughs> just hasn't changed in the old or new organizing model. It's all about, you know, the role of the organizer is uh, dominant in the Alinsky model. So you would then, if you were an Alinsky organizer, you took two or three years to build to the first Congress. This would be the founding meeting. This would be when you brought all the various representatives of organizations. Everybody got a per capita membership quota in terms of what they're voting. So if you had a union with, uh, you know, the meat packers in Chicago were a big supporter in their, you know, like back of the yards and fight and, uh, uh, not fight, fight was in Rochester, back of the yards and, and several of the other um, Alinsky Chicago based organizations. So they, if you had 10,000 members, you had 100 people in that. Congress, you could sit down. If you were from the Lutheran Walther League Youth Club, then you might have two that were there. But their whole point was filling up the room with people who supposedly each represented an organization in whatever they defined as, as that community. And at that point, in the, late, in the 50, late 50s when Saul started, through the 60s and to the early 70s when they stopped, and he died in 72, its original focus was, in fact, largely minority communities in the United States, largely African American, but it was to organize the urban poor, as, as uh, they called it then. In 72, 73, it switched to being a middle income based organization, and the model changed after Olinsky died, and uh, they were more, they were trying to build, in some ways, some of the same legitimacy to be able to act. But it was all based on picking one or two issues a year, um, not direct action, but bringing the target in. Uh, slang is such a problem. Um, so if, uh, if in an ACORN, 100 people want to go down to City Hall and sit in and demand that garbage be picked up or a housing program be started, that's what they do. That's very unusual for a faith-based organization, or for an Alinsky organization. They put together the big meeting once a year, which may have anywhere between 500 and 5,000 people there, and they try to invite the targets in. So they would invite them to come speak, but basically just to answer questions. So they would have people from the audience or their constituency groups primed to ask a specific question. Let's say, it's London citizens, and they want to ask what your commitment, what your position is on living wage for cleaners in downtown London. Well, you would be asked that question. You don't go, you know, running your mouth about something else. You either answer yes or no. You sign your name if they get a commitment on that. And that's the, the fundamental, you know, Lins Alinsky derivative organization. Now, London citizens is uh, like a shirt tail cousin from the Alinsky model. So. It, no, I mean, many of you are familiar with their activity. Don't think, oh, what they're doing is what let me know. In some ways, it's uh, what London Citizens does is sort of a mixture of uh, the Alinsky model and some, you know, it's it's a hybrid. Um, so but like regardless, that's how it's like building an alliance of, of a congress of lots of representative groups. That's the theory. The problem has to do from there are many problems, but if you're organizing lower income families, which is what <coughs> is how I've spent my time, low and moderate people, you organize essentially powerless people. So to say that various organizations of the powerless put together create power or legitimacy is really, that's a stretch. And particularly if you add on this element that says you have to be apolitical, then it doesn't, the problem with a membership is members understand voting as political power. 
So if you have to start training organizers to have a dialogue with members about power that says it can't be political, you're really starting <laughs> from a place you can't ever get to. And there's no, there's no way to get home. But, I, you know, I don't want to, we do have an agenda. We're going to go through all this, you know. Y'all you know, you know, keep trying to cheat for the answers at the end. London? Yeah, please. I just want to say, because you started off saying. Jag, or what yeah, was your name? Jag, or Degrati, Jagrati. It means a white kid from the Hindu okay. Sanskrit. Ah, okay. 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 Oh, but enough about me. Uh, enough should, about you. Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> you started off saying you wanted to know uh, how it linked in the way we're operating, or we've been, we've been trained to operate, and how it fits in with the way you've done it. And what I want to get, uh, say to you is that uh, you mentioned about building groups, and um, that was the Olinsky model, but what we're told to do is build networks. But let me say, the way we're being trained, there's no rigid guidance, and we, um, we're, not giving, we're not giving rigid guidance, which is good, because it's not prescriptive. And we have not just studied Alinsky, but we've also studied Freya, who I prefer to Alinsky. And I don't know if you could say a bit more about that. But well, anyway, Freya wasn't an organizer. No, but, the, oh. he, no, but his ideas, We're talking about apples theories, and oranges here, right? Okay, fine. Yeah. But his theories, I think, are relevant to organizing. And, you know, but anyway, that, we won't get into that debate. But anyway, just one thing I want to say is there's lots of contradictions involved in what we're trained to do, such as we're not supposed to have an agenda bring our own agenda, when we're supposed to be impartial, but we're supposed to build networks and bring the... Well, at least I know where you stand, Jack. All right. Um, <laughs> and I'm not saying there isn't power outside of electorate. I'm just saying, once you say there's no power, you're building power and say you can't be involved in electoral in any voting. People don't get that. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah sure. People do understand there's power in action. That's yeah, sure. The collective just, enterprise is what we do. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> Sorry. All righty. Um, <laughs> just want to see how far off topic we are. <laughs> I apologize. No, no, no apologies necessary. But um, we organized a whole lot of things under the umbrella of ACORN because we were trying to organize a constituency of low to moderate income people. So I, I less bleed to death over community organizing than organizing people wherever I can get them to act. And if that turns out to be at the workplace, through a workers association or a union, then that's fine too. If it turns out to be where they live, where, then that, that works great too. And that's so all these pieces came together. There's membership in mass base. Our, the whole point is we wanted to get big enough to make a difference. So it never was operating just to deal with that one community, whether it was a specific community in Little Rock or New Orleans or Brooklyn or wherever. It was always about how to both deal. We operated under a principle called coordinated autonomy. Each membership unit had the ability, raising its hand to vote, to make a decision about issues, tactics, actions, politics within its own range. So if it was in that community, then it could act with autonomy in that community. But if the point, for example, its issue was citywide, then it had to convince all the rest of the Acorn affiliated groups in that city to be with them. It couldn't all of a sudden say, we're speaking for the whole organization in, in uh, you know, Los Angeles. It had to go to a citywide board meeting, convince the majority of the rest of the groups to act with them. So if it was a living wage issue, you couldn't have living wage issue from the North End or Hackney, you had to have a living wage issue that was all of the city of Los Angeles or wherever that was. Same thing at the state level and then national level. At each level you had to get the majority of all 38 states that were organized in the country to agree on a national campaign. And that's that's how we work. So there's always coordinated administrations, that's all passe. Uh, you know, you don't need to do that stuff, we hear you. But we never, we never quite believed that. Um, so we kept, kept marching, as the slogan said. Multi-issue and campaign triggered. We believe you have to win, but issues are important. We'll get into that democratic, people get to vote. We were and still are the only community organization uh, that was existed in the states or Canada that was willing to be political if the members decided that and coordinated autonomy. Just covered that too. So we're, we're making great progress. <coughs> OK. 
Okay. Acorn International is still, well, that one didn't work out too well there, did it? It's a federation. We organize um, both in, in places like Latin America and India, we essentially organize in mega slums, Dharavi and Mumbai. Um, and we organize uh, in places like India and Argentina and elsewhere, we organize unions of lower wage workers as part of the, the program of what we're involved in. <coughs> so I've just got a question. Why do you say community and labor? Because it's not with low-wage workers. Aren't low-wage workers labor? Sorry, I've just... We only organize unions of low-wage workers. We don't organize unions of high-wage workers. Right, okay. Interesting. Okay, no, move on. <laughs> Sorry, move on. Did you understand what I'm saying? I understand, yeah. I mean, why? I don't think... I understand. There's a lot of energy in my union brothers. There's a lot of energy to organize workers that make good wages. Dues are better, for example. I mean, that's, unions are based on dues. There's not a lot of energy organizing informal workers, contingent yeah. workers, low wage workers. And undocumented workers. Yeah. Well, a lot of them are low wage workers. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Okay, be, question from the back. That was to clarify there might be a cultural difference here because in the UK, trade unions don't, there's not a distinction between organizing low wage workers and organizing other workers. In the UK, sort of there's not that distinction in the US either. Okay. They right. just don't do it. Okay. So that's seen as like a need that's outside traditional trade unions. It's a need by default. It's not part of the, I mean, yes, the established labor movement, institutional labor should organize all workers. They should organize low wage workers as aggressively as they organize, you know, workers making 15, 20, 25 dollars an hour. It just doesn't happen. There's a reason it doesn't happen. It has to do with the economics of organizing trade unions, frankly, and it has to do with a lot of history unions. But, so there is a huge, broad sector that, in our view, needs more organization that we can make a contribution in. We focus only on where we can make that contribution, which is lower wage workers. That's not to say other unions don't do it. I was a local for the Service Employees International Union in the United States. It's the largest union in the United States. Uh, our local union started out as independent. Now it's independent again for 25 years. We were part of SEIU and organized Millions of often lower wage workers, but that was not what really paid the bills was public employees. And its real focus was not necessarily on those janitors or on those home care workers. And uh, it's a long story. But it's a big world. And most low wage workers, you know, UK or United States or Canada, I mean, if you look at a place like India, if you're a hawker or a rag picker or a Rickshaw driver, there's no union for it, period. Right. Somebody was waiting. Yeah? Just going to ask, are you going to explain a bit more into what you mean by organizing the union? Because like they already sound, I mean, they're already quite organized, so I just wondered what you meant by that. Are you going to get into that later? Yeah, later, but you know, I'm not going to avoid the question now. Go just scrap the spare battery for the camera. Yeah, <laughs> run up here. Right on the ground. In the United States, uh, less than 7% of the private sector is now in unions. So 93% are in unions. I don't know those numbers here. Uh, Union membership is declining rapidly in this country. It's all over yeah. the world. Yeah, it's about 27% of the workforce are in unions. Yes. Yeah. Public and private? Public and private. So yeah. we're at 12.9% in the US, public and private. Public and private. So we're at 12.9% in the US, public and private, with almost 35% public employees organized. But only, you know, less than 7% private. We're on the way, you know, the absolute membership is still around 12 million, but the country gets bigger, unions aren't getting bigger, our percentage of the workforce is getting smaller and smaller. So yeah. particularly among private sector workers, that's being cored out everywhere. Canada, in the last uh, 10 years since I've been working in Canada, it's gone down from 35, 36% down to hardly over 30%. Majority, once again, is from public sector unions. Yeah. You're hardly at 12% uh, private sector in Canada. We could go country to country. In India, you know, the percentage is less than 4 or 5% of everywhere. And when you have a conversation about private sector versus public sector, 
no private sector workers virtually are in unions in, in India. So, you know, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's a problem. Yeah. They have a higher percentage, and uh, but, uh, and that the most unequal countries in the U.S. have some of the highest inequality rates, do correspondingly have lower. Unions make a huge difference in equality. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I can't quote all those skin. I mean, I don't organize any Scandinavian countries, but um, yeah. And unfortunately, even in those countries, there's a pushback against equality. So, I mean, this, uh, the neoliberalism of the world is, you know, hey, we don't need to go there. We're still talking about skills. We're still talking about how you can do something all of you can do and I can do. But, you know, there are big problems in the world. You know, we better do our damn share, okay? So, and we'll get into unions if we have more time, but, uh, you know, I know y'all aren't going to be organizing the unions. So, let, how about this though? There's a video we recently found that get, might give you a better sense of how ACORN works. It was done several years ago by an intern with ACORN Canada. So, I'm sort of a techno cousin. This is now about the fifth PowerPoint. Definition is something that is replicable. And with a fair level of certainty, you know if you go through the pieces, if you learn what that model is, a predictable result will emerge. So what we fashioned and wrote down in 1974, 40 years ago on the ACORN model, it's available on the website. You can go through it. It's sort of an archaic document. It talks about things that are being foreign to the United States now. But if you follow those steps, we couldn't guarantee you'd have 200 people at the first meeting or 50. But if you did the work, we can absolutely guarantee, no matter where it was, there would be a community organization form. And looking at what uh, your materials look at as a model, there was nothing, there were, there were techniques that they recommended and ideologically argued were a model, like listening. Well, I believe in listening. I actually, there's a, you know, in public radio, they had a thing about, you know, they invited different people to talk on the national, uh, NPR, National Public Radio radio in the U.S. I actually did a piece on listening, so when I saw that in your training material, I said, listening, listening, how about listening, because listening is what makes organizers, it's your ability to listen to what people are saying so that you can help move what they want to do into the organizational context so you can take action. That's part of what organizing is by definition. So, but what I couldn't tell from the model, even though you kept calling it a model of your training materials, is what you would do that would be replicable. Because it actually seemed like, although there were techniques they wanted you to use, it was all throwing it up against the wall and see what, you know, see what works, and if you hear something, write it down, report, you know, report to somebody, and you know, and then I, I got lost. And I, I actually know a fair amount about organizing, but you know, so I'm so interested in how y'all would define this experience. What we talked about, <laughs> and that was about as positive as I could be. <laughs> you just saw my best construction on this. So, when we talk about an organizing model, the foundation of the ACORN model was an organizing committee. I thought I had technical problems. We really try to learn how to read my handwriting. <laughs> In state school where I grew up, penmanship and behavior didn't do well. Didn't do well. This was well in the rest, but not, that, not those two. So first you have to define what neighborhood you're trying to organize. That's the fundamental part of any model. You have to have a sense of what is going to be your base. If it's a geographically based community organization, what is the geography? Is there a geographical explanation for where you work as organizers for any of you? Yes. yes. And how big is the geography? It depends there. on the different areas and different organizers. It varies between the locations. Gotcha. 
Can I just add to that? Yeah. Um, our boundaries or the wards we work in, for example, my ward has 14,000 people about that. How many over, households? With 6,000 uh, 6, plus households. Okay. Right, but let me just add um, communities don't have boundaries, geographical boundaries, that is. So we do have leeway to work outside of that geographical area. Do you understand, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So there's overlap, obviously. You know, you might live in one area, but your kids go to school in another area. You might want to organise in that kid's school. You don't live in that area where we are organising. That's an example. Sorry. Depends on the issues. Depends, yeah, it does. Um, also to add, um, there's like differences according to our host organisations. So <coughs> I'm appointed to working in a ward in a town, whilst I know that uh, colleagues in Sunderland have told to organise a whole city. So, <laughs> 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 bigger Sunderland. Yeah. Two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's helpful. If it's geographically based. The ideal size we look for is between 1,500 families and 2,500 families. But it can be smaller. We've organized groups in as few places as few as two or 300 families. We've organized them with five, 10,000 families. It's all, unfortunately, it's all organizing the math. This is always a problem in talking to organizers. Almost all organizers ran from math. <laughs> and they're still screaming. You know, it's like that. So when I, when I work with our organizers, they say, oh no, it's math shaming coming. <laughs> this is all simple math. This is not math shaming. This is no you know, complicated algebra we're doing. But here's how the organizing math works. In organizing, historically, I don't care what country it is, an axiom of organizing is if you can ever move 10% of the population, you can represent the entire population. So part of what you're looking for is whether, the, whether it's you know, 200,000 people, which might be, I don't know, 5,000 families, I mean, not 50,000, uh, 50,000 families or whatever, is you're looking in the, in the, you know, along the timeline or the longevity of, of your organizing plan at what it takes to get some percentage. Now, you could be happy with 2%. You could be happy with 20%. We've had community groups we've built that actually signed up a majority of the people in entire towns that they do. But you're looking for a membership basis over time and during the drive that would establish you fully as the representative organization in that piece of ground. I don't really care what the ground looks like. So, but it all becomes important when you, so 10% is important, but if you're going to organize whatever you look at as that community, we recommend that the organizing committee be at least 1%. So, no mass shaming. That's 15 or 25, right? Yes. yes. This, now I'd like you with me, wait. Yeah, come on, wait, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you want, and the reason you want, you know, a fairly minimum number of people on your organizing committee is because they're going to do the work in the organizing drive. It's not about the organizer single-handedly. And we believe we'll hear in door knocking, home visits, so it's not like the organizer has to figure out how many years of their life it would take to hit each individual door in a community of 200,000. That wouldn't work, would it? So you need, you need an organizing committee. The bigger the constituency that you're trying to organize, the larger the organizing committee. You need an active organizing committee, not just people sitting. Questions? No, oh, come in, brother. <laughs> Introduce yourself as you come through. I made everybody do this. Who are you? I'm Da here. I'm a community organizer from Bristol, well, South Gloucestershire. Oh! <laughs> Who's that? Oh! Near the pigs, right? What? Oh, dear. No, it's my path. So, and 
even if, whatever the organization is, the union, you want, you know, you want to have some rule of thumb about how to do the work. Because the rest is math. So if you're, if you're talking about, let's say, uh, let's keep it easy. So if it's, if you're talking about a community that has 2,000 uh, 2, households, and let's say the average family is a family of four, then you're talking about 500 doors or homes that you're going to have to hit in the course of that overnight. Right? So the timeline we use on, a, on the organizing model is we want to have the group the basic door knocking phase go between four and six weeks. From the time we have the first organizing committee meeting, six weeks later, we want to have the big meeting in that community that brings people out. So in terms of the organizing math, if you're going to hit 500 doors across four weeks, or across six weeks, you can fix. Yeah, 51 weeks to get 500. To get 500. To get 500. 51 weeks? Yes. Mm. <laughs> what, nap time is it two? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, I'm not talking about your program. I'm talking about organized. Okay? I don't know. That's a nice job you got there. But for those of you who have to organize, you actually have to have people still remember that you talked to them at the time. Yes. So if you talk to them today and then you get to the 500th family a year from now and say, okay, who's going to come to the meeting? I guess you have. And it's never what people say. I mean, you know that, right? It's really what your analysis is and it's based on, we'll get that in the door knocking. So, uh, so anyway, all of a sudden this is not that hard. And you want to do more because hitting those 14 people, when you're actually hitting the doors, what's your experience? And, and all of you, do all of you hit the doors? You know what I'm talking about. You, go, yeah. you do home business? Yeah. Okay, we're talking about So, what's your not home ratio? How many doors do you have to hit to talk to 10 people? Well, yes, one day I hit 25 and there was only um, 8 people on so it just depends on being fairly quiet. I'll tell you, organizing doesn't depend. It really is fairly consistent average. So, roughly 30 to 35%, right? Others? It depends on the type of state you're on, because if you're... Mm -hmm. If you're on a state where more people work, or on a state where most people are out of work, mm -hmm. you're going to have a much higher percentage. Well, what times do you go knock? Well, but, but once again, math is important in organizing. So if you're going to maximize your effectiveness, and you think more people are working in that particular state, what hours would you door knock to get at least 35% real visits for the doors you're hitting? Weekends might be possible, but <coughs> what hours do people mainly do their own business? Between 9 and 5. Okay, so you're always going to have low numbers, 9 and 5. So we put our organizers essentially hit doors in 4 and 8. So they hit four, 4 hours of doors every day, helping train the organizing committees, work with the organizing committees, and we tried to get that period where we had the maximum number of lower income working families home. You know, uh, that's not to say people don't work at night, you can't find them at noon. That's not to say people never went out and hit the doors at other times, but you go with your maximum effectiveness. Yeah. So I'm still not quite clear. So your, your, ask, your organizing committee is, is knocking on these doors? You're training the organizing committee to knock on the doors. So where are you getting your organizing committee from? The organizer helps train those organizing committee door knocking teams, goes out with them regularly. Because it's all about success. Yeah. How did you get so yeah. into first place? Yeah. So like you, you start in, in a community, there's like five of you on a Saturday in one chapter, so let's say. How do you get, do you need to knock on the door before you can get on the So in building the organizing committee, <coughs> I'm actually going to go back to that, but it's a good time. Okay. So let's say this is your geographical yeah. neighborhood. And you want to build, it has these 2,000 families, you want to get 20 people, as part of your organizing committee, they'll do the work. Where would you start? Now, y'all are all with agencies or somebody. Does anybody you work with know people already there? So, why not start with them? Because the power lies with them. 
Is that right? Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but not strictly. Yeah. Personally, I chose not to go to those people because, and this is a, this is a personal choice maybe, but those people already have power. There's not a problem with them already having power. Sometimes there is. So, for example, you've got a residence association that's been going for 20 years, totally ineffective. It's got one ego at the top, has quite a lot of power, doing nothing with it. So, why would I go back to that person? And it, it, from experience, having ignored that person and then gone back to them, I did not regret ignoring them to start. <laughs> so, for me, it's about like knocking on the doors and finding the people that haven't got the power yet and maybe trying to get them together to gain some of the power of the people that yeah. have got it and aren't using it. And, you know, if you look for the agenda, you see I'm door knocking, I say, you know, and you and I are on the same wave here. You're doing it for two reasons. One is to bring some people into the organization, and the other is to keep some people out of the organization. <laughs> and this is often a very controversial point, but you're right. I mean, there are people who, in fact, you can't be a liberal in this work. You can't say, doors wide open, we want everybody to, because you will have people that already have an entitlement in the community, whatever. But I think that you do visit some of the gatekeepers in order to neutralize them. You don't want to necessarily, I mean, I've had people show up at our meetings to try to disrupt and whatever. You know, it's sometimes it's easier to go ahead and do the business. But what I'm looking for in talking, even to those people, is other names. I'm building a rough and formal list of people who might be worth talking to. Anybody whose name I hear three times, I will absolutely do anything, move heaven and hell, and I will, have, I will visit that person because it's obviously somebody who, if I'm going to organize that neighborhood, I have to visit. I have to be able to say, even if they told me, you shouldn't die. I've got to be able to say, I met with them. Hey, oh yeah, I talked to, I talked to Georgia. Yeah, I talked to Georgia. Well, what, was she going to join ACORN? No, I'm not sure, but I had a good conversation with her. <laughs> so whatever, you, you know, you go do the work. You go talk to Georgia, but I, I actually had the conversation. I told her about ACORN, and I'll find one positive thing she said about it, and I'll say, no, I'm not going to say, oh no, I'm afraid to talk to Georgia. I hadn't talked to Georgia. No, whatever, because then Georgia could be a problem. You know, but I'm trying to build a list. I want an organizing committee in a geographical neighborhood that's broadly representative. It doesn't help me if my whole organizing committee is from one section. It's the equivalent of a hot shop in a union drive. You know, if a hot shop may be one piece that's very enthusiastic, it doesn't say anything. Most union elections are lost in the United States following hot shop leads because they aren't broad enough to understand what the whole workplace is like. People think, oh my God, this is going to be easy. It came in, they're hot, they're got... But, so I want to make sure if I've got big issues in this area and start to find four or five people there, that I'm still doing whatever I can to go out there. I'll hit churches, I'll hit gatekeepers, I'll hit small business people, I'll hit anybody I can to start finding who people look to as leaders in their area or people that have been active. My experience in every community in the world I've ever worked in, every workplace, is there's always a history before you got there of some kind of activity. You want to find what is that history that you can build on. Because even though I'm building a new organization, totally different than any organization there, largely unorganized turf, I want to find wherever there's that history of struggle that says people can win. That goes back there and find those people, find that issue, and that helps define how I'm building the organization. I'll use that history, five years, 20 years, 50 years, whatever it was, to help define what's possible for ACORN. So you make a list, community leaders or gatekeepers <laughs> are important. Either neutralize them, get them with you, or find out other names from them, the local priest, the local principal, I mean, the local union, whatever it is, it can tell you where they know people in that neighborhood. Where you can go and say, okay, I talked to, uh, you know, your union, said you live in this area, or whatever, we're talking about something very close to a union, except it's going to operate around issues here in the community, would you be interested in, you know, helping do some work, this is not heavy lifting, but I'm, you know, uh, okay. The worst case, I'll start hitting some blocks. Let's say I've got, you know, I need 20 people, I've got 17, but I don't have anybody from this whole area. Well, I'll go out there naked 
and I'll start hitting some doors. Hey, you know what I'm talking about? You know, I'm going to organize the court, you know, that, you know, whatever. You know, I know so and so and a lot, lot of time with them. We're getting an organized committee together. And thought maybe you might be interested. And I'll try to find somebody who's got, you know, looks like they got a heartbeat. So that I have somebody to come from that area as part of the organizing committee. Yes, ma'am? What do you ask when you do the door knocks? Because I'm not sure what. Is the aim of the well, right now, we're talking about a very specific task. What it takes to get people to commit that they will invest time, energy, and effort in being on the organizing committee. So that's my fundamental ask. I'm explaining ACORN at the same time. I'm telling what we do and what we are. But so I want you to commit to do work on building this tribe. So only on the committee, not uh, volunteering in general in their community. I'm, I'm, well, not, no, I'm there to organize a local group. Because we do. There's a similar thing where you you find the sort of key people in your community wherever you're working, and then eventually it. it Hello. You had a question. Or well, yeah, you? I had a I had a question because I'm I'm curious of when you knock on a door, what's your approach? Because um, the way we, we are assigned to approach it is that we ask people what they love, what their concerns are, and we go through that. Is there a, a set of questions which you ask people before you discuss? Yeah. We have a whole section. Oh, right. right. We're going to plow through door knocking. We're going to spend some time door knocking. We're talking about what the structure of a wrap is, because I think the structure for a wrap is actually important for mm. people. We're going to actually do role playing so that we can all mutually embarrass ourselves with our door knocking skills. Um, and we're, you know, we're, going to, we're going to spend time on that. But I just want to get through this one part, but I'm going to stop for more questions first. I just wanted to make a statement, just to kind of back up what you're saying a little bit, Doug. I'm seeing a lot of correlation between what you do and what we do, right? what you've pointed out to me highlights what I understand to be a flaw of what we do, mm -hmm. which is that we train needs. And actually, a lot of our time is spent in trying to just understand how to be organizers in the first place, which means that that whole process gets extended out. So I completely agree with what Jag's saying. But actually, when we're talking about targeting 500 people and ending up the whole team of 10, that's exactly what you're saying there, but it's, it's kind of dragged out. It's mm -hmm. done in a slightly different way. Kind of dragged out in a year versus a month? Well, well, no, the idea is that once you've got that holding team, I guess from that, you're going to have that four to six week process. That it's not you doing it, but it's that. Yeah, that I really don't know what happens mm -hmm. once you have. Mm -hmm. yeah. Maybe we'll get to that. Yeah. But. Okay, thanks. Can I ask, if it's a very limited time for you between knocking on the doors and then organizing meetings. Exactly. Um, do you get time to go back or really get to know the people that you're listening to? To build a relationship with them. Do you, do okay, but let me be very clear. Their relationship with me is based on the fact I know they want to build an organization and I know something about how to build an organization. So they may like red hair, they may not like red hair. They may, you know, think that I'm an interesting person, they may think I'm, you know, a bore. They only deal with me because I happen to know something about this one skill set, how to put an organization in their hands that can win for them. So the exchange with me is I'm not going to move into the community. I'm not building it. I mean, I have a huge number of friends I've made in this business, but that's not what, I don't build a relationship. Those relationships came out of long time struggle in the organization, so you end up with those relationships. But it's not me building a relationship with them. It's me assisting them to build an organization they want in order to deal with the issues they're trying to deal with. Yo, I think we've all spotted what's happening here, but I'm going to put a label on it or a name on it. When, when you're using this technique to knock on a door, you know why you're doing it and what you want and what the purpose is. And you can even say to people what the purpose is. I think many of these people are being sent out to listen, to take what they've learned to people who are interested in, ta in hearing what they've learned and leave it with them because they aren't really allowed to articulate a political agenda. I don't think a political agenda is building an organization. I think it, it is, yes it is, but but I mean, if, if you're knocking... Well, I'm saying no, it isn't. It, okay, good. But no, you can say yes, it is. I can no, no, say no, no, it's no, 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 no. I'm not going to let no, you get no, away with it. Just saying, yeah, it is. But. No, no, I've got, I've got confused. Hold on. If you're knocking a door and you're, you're training your... You've got your influential people, you've found your people, you take them out and train them. When someone says, what's this about? 
you, you will have to be honest, won't you? You say, well, it's about acquiring power. You have to use language that you think people won't run away it's from. It's about building an organization. Yeah. That's exactly correct. And, and what's it going to do? Well, it's going to try and make things better, isn't it? You know, and, and maybe you have a few examples that you already know are problems that people are pissed off with, yeah? But I'm not sure these colleagues are, it's, it's not explicit to them that that's what they may do. I understand. And that, that's where we're, we're and, rubbing And let me repeat this. Terms. I said from the very beginning, I've read your training materials. I'm not sure what the end result of what you're supposed to do is. So, can somebody briefly explain what all you training people do? I've never heard of you. <laughs> 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 I mean, can I try and explain it to you? Can I just try and explain it? Okay, so the listening process is about trying to find out from it's called individuals. The it's called the process. listening process because okay. we follow something called Root Solutions Listening Matters. And just set this up. Uh, organization no, it's their ideology. Regenerate is, is the training organization. They're useless for into that. So the <laughs> listening model, it, it can work, it's quite powerful, but the idea is you're actually trying to find out from one individual what's stirring them, what, what do they hate, what's amazing, what do they want to build on, or what's really crap and what needs to change. And from that, they may go on and do something completely separate to you, nothing to do with forming a holding team, they could go on and set up a social enterprise, they could go and take over the world, who knows? Or they could that, do nothing. Or they could do nothing, yeah. But that's meant to kind of stir them to action. And who's funding this? The government. But it's not politically related, apparently. But it is politically because we're meant to ask whether people vote. So there is that element. The idea is this is about increasing voter turnout. You know, if you're looking at it from a government perspective, that's why they funded it, if we're going to be honest about it. But um, what we do is we speak to 500 people, from that we hopefully get a holding team. The holding team gather all of that evidence that comes from that whole community and they decide what to do. And it's a holding team because it's meant to constantly be decentralising power. It's not me as an organiser who can decide what that community needs. It's the 10 people in that holding community who are hopefully representative of that whole community who decide what to do with that information. And hopefully that 10 people have another 30 odd people, maybe more, can assist them to make whatever they choose happen, whether that's going to power and saying we want to oust our organisation. How do, how do you move people into action through this model? There are other hands that are up. I'm going to get rid of all these hands and I'm going to go back to the, <laughs> going to the model because that's the answer to your question. I was just going to tell the gentleman that when we're doing this, we're doing it to empower people. Um, and then we, we facilitate it, so what they want to do, we facilitate. And actually, we help set up projects from a listening on a Thursday, we could be setting up a, a, a project with them by the next week. Ruth and I can work quite close together sometimes on projects. So uh, last week, I think it was, a lady wanted to set up a holistic therapy um, free for m mothers with challenging children. As, so at the end of last week, Ruth and I had a house meeting with her, which is what you go on from a listening with some of her friends. And um, this week, uh, tomorrow, um, the lady's going to be cleaning up a room that I found with her. Um, she got for free. Next Thursday, she's starting the classes. So the mum's going to come in, have this therapy to help positivity, etc., etc. We've got a song club starting up um, in a week or so time. Uh, you know, to empower this other lady to do that. We held a Santa's Grotto, so the children come for a pound, and one mother turned around and said to us, my kids have never seen Santa before, thank you so much for doing this. And the two mums set it up, we had no money to start with at all. They went around and knocked on doors in all the shops, um, they got funding, they got £100 funding from somewhere else, they got um, decorations online for free. They did it all themselves, just because we said, you can do this, why haven't you done this, and we asked probing questions. It's not just about... Once again... None of this is meant to be pejorative to whatever in the world you're doing. I'm just trying to lay out, and, I, and I'm just determined to do so, how a particular organizing model works if what you wanted to do was build an organization that tries to have a mass base. This is not individually based. It's not just about how many of us can help this one person do whatever they want to do. It's how to build a vehicle that the maximum number of people in the community might decide they can collectively act through. That's all it tries to do. And so I'm just going through what this system is for what it's worth. And then we can talk more about what you're doing, how it, whether it works or doesn't work. So we were, we were lost in the swamp of getting the organizing committee. Let's just jump, let's say we got that organizing committee. They have a meeting, they decide to, to 
initiate this process of building an organization over whatever it is, a four to six week period, in which they're going to figure out a way to get every door they can throughout that neighborhood. What they're trying to do is create a sense in that particular piece of turf that this is the biggest thing that's ever happened in this community. They're trying to flood the community with, they're going to hit every door, they're going to put a leaflet on every door, gonna, you know, even trying to hit every door, I think we've already established that we'd lucky to actually have, you know, direct visits with more than 30 or 35 percent. They're going to try to get, you know, every church to, you know, put it in their church bulletin. They're going to try to get the school to put, you know, a flyer out in every, you know, buddy's lunchbox. They're going to, you know, when I used to organize these groups, I'd take a bet with all these, you know, the community leaders that are your favorites in the back about how many people would go. And they'd say, oh, well, you know, it'd be wonderful if you got 20. Well, what if we had 100? And you want to prove that this will be the most representative, the most participation you have in that particular community. Because you're doing the work that you're basically flooding that area with this notion that if people are talking about this issue or that issue or the other, there's a laundry list of issues. There are a lot of issues in this community. You're going to have to be at the meeting. You're going to have to decide which issue to do first. If your issue is important, it'll be on that list. Now, most people vote to do this issue first as opposed to that one. That'll be the first issue. But you keep pushing, your issue will come up. But you want everybody who <laughs> figures out an issue. Now look, when we go through door knocking, any of you who have door knocked have gone to people and say, well, what do you think about the neighborhood? Do you see any issues here in the neighborhood? And how many times do people say, no, I'm good? Yeah. No issues. So when people say you don't have an agenda, well, you're already looking for issues. That's, our, that's an agenda. So let's you know, be frank about it. I mean, you're out there. I mean, the classic list expression is, you know, rub raw the sores of discontent is what he used to argue as part of the organizing technique here. But you do hear issues. And those issues in the dialectic of organizing come forward when you ask questions. Well, no issues. Uh, saw an abandoned house down the block. Is that ever a problem? Well, is that an agenda? Is that interference? Is that, you know, somehow break some vow or whatever? No, I mean, you're talking about something that's obvious. Somebody sped by on the neighborhood. What are the schools like? I mean, what's that? You know, there's a whole, you ask questions. I know you're listening for the answers. But I know how the dialectic of organizing works. Listening is key, but you're listening and probing to find out what issues people care about. And even though many, most people you talk to will start out by saying, yeah, you know, I've not lived here a while. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm going to live here that long. I don't have any issues. I'm good, whatever. That's all what in organizing we call testing. People almost always make you work to get them to talk. Um, you have a, your hand on the back? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that. Um, well, when you say we have an agenda because um, when we're listening, we listen for issues. We're not actually listening just for issues, we're listening for um, whether people have things that they love or they have you know, anything they want to talk about, basically. It's open and we don't have so necessarily direct agendas where it's not just to listen to issues or just what people love, it's anything they want to talk about. Look, I've read the materials. That is your agenda. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so that, that is, is your agenda. agenda. So, You're listening for issues. I mean, you're trying to run people through one channel or another to come back to you so you can listen to what they're saying. And it's based on a dialectical model, which is also what I use in door knocking, of questions and response. I mean, that is what you're doing. I'm not, you know, that, that we're not going to argue about because that's what you do. Now, are you trying to guess what the answer will be? None of us can guess what the answer will be. I don't know when I go into community whether housing is going to be a bigger issue than education than stoplights and, you know, somebody building a factory in the middle of the neighborhood or whatever. Um, but once, I, once we have this organizing committee, they're going to start talking about the issues that they have because they're going to start putting together what I call the laundry list of the issues they have. And when we talk to people on this door knocking, you know, process of this four to six weeks, We'll say, hey, some people in the neighborhood are talking about A, B, and C, whatever issues we've already heard. Now, that may mean, once again, I'm transparent about this, that immediately when people hear one of those two or three, they say, hey, you know, that third issue is an issue for me. But you're also looking for what's number four, five, and six. 
yeah, I actually kind of like the schools, but you know what I don't like? Because you're trying to get that conversation where you can hear what moves them. We keep the information, and I'm sure you do too, uh, about what we're hearing on our door knocking cards, which now are on computers, and no longer, you know, for years are on three by five cards. So you're actually trying to sort through whatever issues people come up with, because over the length of that organization, whether it's you as the organizer or some other organizer, people are going to be looking for what Joe Smith or Jane Doe had to say about particular issues in that community, and they may not all be that first issue. But what you're trying to move people on is whatever issue they say is of interest to them, the organization is going to be a vehicle that can deal with those issues. Then act collectively, and that all you need to do is be a part of that organization and get people to agree with you. And your issue will come up. You're by yourself. And everybody does understand by themselves they can't do it. So I'm, I'm trying to rush through this, but you go through the process. You're inundating the community with the notion of the organization. You've created a happening. Comes a big meeting, and I'm, we'll go through. I mean, obviously in an Acorn Drive, we also get people to join the organization. So our part of the commitment process is that many people, before they've ever seen the organization have a first meeting, join right there on the door and agree they want to be part of Acorn, pay dues, go the whole way. And I know that probably sounds wild, so just trust me on that, you know? Um, but once again, we're building an organization. This is how the organization works. People understand if they want to deal with it. It's got to be supported by people, and people pay for what they care about, and they pay dues. That's how we work, like a union and community. So, and the dues are not extremely high, so people uh, join at very high rates, usually one out of, of Door knocking rates are about the same for everybody, you know, anywhere from 30 to 35 percent in terms of home visits. Of those visits, two out of ten we have will join the organization the first time we have a conversation. What we look for after the first meeting is there's additional phases until we get that total membership up to 10 percent. And then it builds sort of like a snowball going down a hill. It'll get bigger on its own with the, without a door knocking process. So you get to the first meeting, what do you want? If you're, you want, if a well done drive is to get somewhere around 1% of that, of those households at the first meeting physical. So I think visits with potential leaders, because those could be obviously what makes that group blow up into something really good. Because there is obviously a diminishing patience with understanding what the basic model is, I try to speed through some of these pieces. But at the end, you will have an organization. That organization will elect leaders. Um, what we used to do in the ACORN model is the first election is temporary officers that serve for the first several months because a lot of people have never seen each other. But invariably, who would you think would be elected in the first group of leaders? Known faces. Known faces, faces from where? Churches. No, but invariably, 80% of the elected leaders in the first group are people who are on the organizing committee because that's who people just saw out there doing the work. It's a sweat equity system. It's not going to be community leaders who just show up out of nowhere. It'll be if somebody, you know, one of these 15 or, you know, 20 people in this organizing committee has been out there and talked to everybody, all of a sudden people know them. So when they think of the organization, they're going to think of who talked with them about it. A defining experience for almost every Acorn member anywhere is remembering who visited them first and talked to them about the organization. So if I ran into organized Acorn members almost anywhere in the world, one of the first things they'll tell me is, oh, well, when so-and-so visited, because that's, that's what made them first start their decision that they wanted to build an organization and be part of it. So inevitably, the first set of temporary officers comes from those people who put in the work. Positive. I think the measure, of the, no, the measure of the success of the organisation, which is why I'm so impressed with it, is it's international. That is fabulous. And this is how you got there. That is what I'm so impressed with. Just want to say there that. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> okay, because you were worried my feelings were hurt or something. No, 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 I'm not saying. I'm kidding. Oh, okay, please, sorry. Because <laughs> I don't get that sense of humour. I'm so out of here. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, sure? Because you were going to prop me up. <laughs> Don't do that again. Okay, so. Brothers, what time were we having lunch? What time were we having <laughs> What time were we having Yeah, I've got break here somewhere. I don't know if it's good for a break or not. Right. We need to go to the lunch. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Sounds yeah. like that's a common experience everybody has. So, in the door knocking you do, is there a certain structure in your rap? Would someone yeah. like to describe how that structure works? As in what you say? Uh, yeah. Um, so, we start by asking people what do they love about where they live. So you walk up to a cold door, well, no, and you right, yeah. go, what do you love? Sometimes. Well, I, I, just, I, I sort of say, hi, Andrew, I'm doing community work, because I don't think, when I say community work, when I go, what? so I just say I do community work, and um, I'm interested in what you love about where you live, and then um, they respond to that, and then I ask them their concerns, and... And do you... Where do you have this conversation? I understand you can have it anywhere in the community, yeah. but if you're knocking, you know, putting the yeah. flesh to the wood, do you have it on a porch and yeah. you yeah. try to go inside? Yeah. I mean, give it varies. Me. Yeah, so I've had it on doorsteps in people's houses. Where do you houses. want it? Um, I suppose it's nicer to have it inside because it's cold outside. <laughs> but do you say as part of the structure of your rap, hey, I'd like to come in and visit with you a couple no. minutes, or just no. stand out there and stretch? No. Okay. Um, it's, it's up to them, and I suppose you start by listening to them, and then you build that relationship after that, and you build that trust. Is there ever a point in the conversation where you say, hey, it would just be easier if I came inside and you didn't have the heat I, coming out of your front door? I let it for them. Just wait for say, a miracle to happen, huh? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Most people but, will. If yeah. They're, if they're receptive, they will. If, if there's a trust, which, I mean, I've found that quite a few have let me in, which is quite nice, but I, I think it varies. And, um, and how many, what percentage of the doors you have that you're in? Um, and you may not count. Obviously, you know, one more of the story, it's worth counting. Yeah. You know, because. This is part of a skill set, is, you know, and as you start counting, you'll find you get invited into more doors, mm -hmm. if, that, if that's important to you. Mm -hmm. You would think logically, and I don't know exactly all of your, you'd think logically you might be more effective in a more informal sitting in their front porch or kitchen table setting when they control that territory. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, the other questions we ask what their vision is for the area, what they'd like to see it like in the future. We then ask what their project ideas or actions are which they can take. Um, and we ask whether they feel they have a say in their area, what they feel they want to say. We challenge them why or why not for those. Um, and we ask if they know other people who we should talk to, whether they want to meet up with them and then exchange contact details and try to finalize another time where we can meet. Um, Is this pretty much similar for other people? There are things you might add or subtract? Or? Like yes. you were saying, if someone mentioned someone's name three times, one of the questions we ask are there other people that I should meet in the area that you feel mm -hmm. most passionate about you as a community of the area. You start to kind of gather other contacts and people and as you're talking to people, what do you have in your hands? Um, um, pad, or this pad. Flipboard, pad. Yeah. Some do you explain that some you're people. taking notes? We yeah. Ask, yeah, I don't anymore. I used to okay. have my pad, but I don't anymore. I do it just talking and then write later. I find it's quite distracting talking yeah. and writing. I use a notebook. We can do it. We want. Yeah. As long as you record it later, if you tell people. It's, it's confidential. But for those people who do have a pad, you say, 
hey, I'm writing this down so I can remember what time you're saying, whatever you say. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I did. Huh? I, I tend to not say I start doing it. Has anybody ever challenged what, what you're writing down there, dude? Yeah. yeah sometimes and then what do you say? And people say, what are you going to do with that information? <clears throat> So it's not really that big an issue for most people, is it? No. I mean, I think it's flexible. I think you, you kind of roll with whatever comes. I mean, it, it's quite easy if you have your own intro. It sounds like that's what you have is your intro. Um, but it's more of a structure. And you, you don't ask the questions one, two, three, four. You pick up. And I think the emphasis is more on building a relationship than getting the questions answered. So explain to me about the building a relationship piece. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not an expert, but, um, hey. <laughs> no, it is. but I think the, what you're trying to do is become that face I think that people will relate to and will trust you to introduce them to other people. And, and the conversation is mainly um, around building that relationship up. Very vague. <laughs> but asking people about themselves, I mean, that's how you build a relationship, isn't it? Like, what, where you come from, what do you do? I mean, that's, that all comes out in in the questions. Mm. Oh, how long have you lived here? Oh, a long time. You must like it. You don't like it. Why is you that staying? part of the structure of your rap? Well, it fits into everybody does their own. The questions Andrew said are the ones that were sort of are prescribed. Pre pres prescribed to yeah. say, and then but you find your own ways to. Mm. I think that's how you build a relationship is by just mm. talking to somebody, and finding out more about them, and to answer your question. And so the relationship is just finding out more about them. Well, I'm saying what they, what what does, you know, light a fire un, un, under their butts, and seeing if if you can do anything to support them to then do something. Okay, we'll start from this table and then the next table. It's building relationships, also finding other information that they might not think <coughs> you want to so the go to camera and say, you knock on another door next week and you want someone who wants to set the camera and you've got an automatic set that you put together and you get together in groups or do you know what's a big set? Do you want to put you in contact? So that's also about finding out the, the more information you can find out about someone, whether they think it's going to be useful to you or not. That's the building relationship. It's the reason for it. The hands in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wanted to add to that the building of a <coughs> relationship is not just for this specific event when you're meeting a person and getting the information and linking with other people you can talk to, but also because this is a process you're starting and the person may not want initially sometimes to do something, but over time they may change their minds. They may want to come with you door knocking and reaching out into the community they want, may want to be trained to do things they may want to do something start a project or initiative but this is um, building the relationship is part of that support mechanism which comes with the listening process that we part of so building the relationship and the trust and the respect in the community <coughs> does help building the networks of people who can continue the work we are doing on our own to have a, a bigger impact. How long are these visits? Sorry? How long do you spend talking to someone on the doors? On a common visit, a standard visit? Yeah. 40 minutes. 40 minutes? Somebody minutes. Minutes. said 20 minutes? So you're there a long time. Full zero. It varies. Sometimes it's five minutes. Sometimes, Sometimes I say no, go away. <laughs> no, we don't want there to be a system. Right. I've got that. This is anarchy on wheels. You get paid for it. There's also finding the root of the problem as well. So right. Like, right. Roots, listening, relationships. I got it. Next. There's two things. With Personally, I choose to share a bit back, so it's not, yeah, yeah, I'm not just gathering information, I'm sharing. So, wh whereas you go and you say, this is an organisation, it's ACORN, I say, I'm a community organiser, I do this because, and I share a bit of my political ideology, that's my own personal way of doing it, because it explains why I'm on that door in the first place, and it kind of breaks down maybe the cynicism, and then the, the relationship building, I guess, is almost like, a way of describing the fact that we're not gathering information. Mm -hmm. We're having a conversation and that information is for us to share within that relationship. 
relationship. And I see the person that I meet on that door, if they're going to be moved to action, they become part of the team, they become that committee. Because I've not done the training with these guys have done stuff, it strikes me that if you take out the word relationship, you could say that you've come on a matter of business. Yeah, you have something to sort out. You want to you want to tell them about what what you want to engage them in, to see if they're interested. The byproduct is the relationship, if there's going to be one, because they say this guy's talking about something. It's interesting, or they say it's not interesting, and you have the discourse, and you see if you can get them to sign up, or see if they'll see if they'll see you again, perhaps to sign up. And I'm sure the relationship is a byproduct. That's trying to interpret your model, and and so I think. To actually direct people to build relationship without necessarily giving them priorities of, of things to be agreed by the time you've left is, is a bit tough. Because you, you, you have some kind of relationship with everybody you speak to. You know, and there's tricks to that, isn't there? And that sort of politeness, smiling, you know, you, you get into it, you learn how to make it work. But to actually be sent out to form relationships sounds a bit weird to me. We do try to we do we do try to yeah. have some next step like so, yeah. but so I'm just I'm just picking apart the language slide. Yeah, yeah. No. Sorry. Everybody's getting their comments, Jack. Sorry, I just want to pick up. You on say me. sorry one more time. Let me tell you, sorry doesn't have any place in this. Okay. Everybody gets to talk. Come on, you know. I've got a quote about that which I'll yeah. share later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I really picked up on what you said. This is Anna Key. I haven't said anything yet. No, you did. You made a very important comment, which articulates the way we've been feeling for the past six months in our training. This is an anarchy on wheels. Oh, okay. That is, that concerned, is yeah. really important because that articulates how we feel. Because I want to know what you've got to say about this process. And I can see why you're asking these questions. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> Help us make sense of what we're doing, please. I don't know if I can do that. <laughs> but we can have a conversation about how to be the most effective on the doors that you can be. And, yeah. um, so I've already conceded, before we take our break, this whole relationship thing, very, 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 very controversial issue in community organizations. So if you don't realize that's true and whatever, Here's, a, here's the word from across the water. This is a very controversial issue. So to say, as people blithely do, you're building relationships in 10, 20, 30 minutes on the doors, those are like Facebook friends. Those aren't relationships that most people would understand, and particularly when you freight them down with other words like trust and, you know, that's, somebody trust you after talking to you, you know, a couple minutes on the doors? That's, I want to go with you. I want to have. So the first question is: We find the positive response almost double inside the house as opposed to outside the house, and that the yeses are almost exponentially greater in that house in terms of ownership, investment, and commitment in the organization. So, because it's an early test, you know, how to get a yes is part of what. It's a waterfall of yeses you're looking for, not a waterfall of no's. So it's very hard when somebody says, no, don't come in. It's just a harder visit, but it says something about the clarity of how you identify a yes or a no when you have that visit. We've done a million visits. We've converted many of them to actual be leaders or attend the first meeting or get in action. But there may be lots of reasons. People are, you know, frequently and maybe embarrassed about their house. They may have a situation in there. There may be anything. So we just keep rolling. You, as soon as you get that no, you go to a yes. But that's also why I think sometimes having ways to make people comfortable about inviting you out or for them to come out with you. The worst conversations are through a screen or with a barrier in front of you. So anything that at least puts you physically in the same space, whether it's in their house, on their porch, or whatever, improves the effectiveness of your your response. Okay, so yes, it's important. Yes, it's harder. And what was the third? What was the third question you asked me? How do you get out? How do you get out? <laughs> we always tell people we're only going to be there a couple of minutes. We know we're interrupting them. You may be, may be feeding your family. We know you're busy. We just need, and we'll define a maximum of time, five or ten minutes of your time. And we always are out of there because we promise them that. If we can't be relied on to live up to our first promise that we ever make to them, then you've, you've ruined the credibility of the 
we'll call, I mean, I would say organization, you say door knocking, you've ruined that relationship already. It's got, they have to be able to take your word to the bank. And if you can't be trusted to say, I'm only going to take five minutes and really only take five minutes, I, I don't know where you start on that relationship with y'all. But I know if you start building an organization, you start digging from a hole. So, yeah, we get out of there. Hey, gee, I know we said we weren't going to take much time, but we've got to talk to everybody in the neighborhood. And if they aren't cooking dinner or don't have three children grabbing their part, their shirt or whatever, if they're really good, I'll ask them to come with us to do the next door. I'll pull them out of that door to go with me. People's commitment to your project or in my terms to the organization <coughs> increases exponentially if they give the round. If they're explaining what you're doing, if they're having to put it in their words, if they're convincing people to join the organization, their commitment deepens each time they hit the doors. So if I can pull somebody right out of the doors with us, I, I've done that a million times. Hey, you know, it's only going to take a minute. Come on. Why not? Do you know your neighbor? Or, you know, I don't know that one, but come on, why don't you meet them? Why don't we? You know, they may have the same thing. No, I'll just pull them out. And then if they say no, I'll go to, we'll get to the structure of the wrap, I hope, someday, uh, eventually here. But, you know, you always end with a yes, even if you know it's not a yes. But. Okay, so we've gotten through the introduction. You may or may not be in the house. You may or may not have decreased the distance. You may be yelling from 10 feet away or, you know, right up in their space. All those things are important. So we've had the conversation, inquiry, and issues. That dialectic seems to be something you're comfortable with. Now, even if you're not asking people what they love, you can notice things in the house, right, or outside or whatever that help you break the ice on the conversation. So there's, there's no harm to say, hey, those are beautiful roses, or are you kidding me? Is that, is that your grandchild? Or something smells good? Or damn, look at the sunshine. Can you believe we're having sunshine? I mean, we are still, I mean, I'm a robot for the organization, but we are human, too. So. Having conversations, humor, all these things are effective, right? Anything that gets people to, to take the tension out of the conversation. People, when they open the door for you, don't expect something good. You may be there with love in your heart and doing what you're doing, but people's expectation when they see you at the door is almost universally bad. So if you're not being clear about what you think they expect when they see you, you're having a problem. Yeah. Just quick question. Do you, yeah. do you wear the acorn t-shirt or shirt when you're doing this? <coughs> I drive for the brand, brother. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that's a U.S. Western expression. You know, sort of, we're now all cattle rustlers now. <laughs> yeah, I ride for the brand. Very clear. Acorn. So every, everybody on the door will have a, a t-shirt. Well, or a... every organizer. So it's immediately clear to the person at the door. Yeah. It's Transparency, you know, I'm really there. And remember, at the end, I'm going to ask them to join. <laughs> I'm going to see if they're ready to come in. Um, now, I don't even want to get into how organizers think about wearing t-shirts and shirts and organizational paraphernalia. Because a lot of organizers think, you know, don't want to do it. You know, I don't want to wear an acorn shirt or I don't want to wear a union shirt or whatever. But just trust me. I've had this conversation a billion times. I'm certainly glad to have it again. But it's an important conversation. Okay. Introduction, conversation. We then move to engagement. Now to get there. Wait, wait, what do you ask them about the... Issues. How, how do you ask? Just say, what are your issues? No, I don't. Because too often people look at you like, I don't have any issues. What are you talking about? What's the issue? I mean, I don't think that's a, the fact that we use that terminology, I don't think means anything to people on the other side of the door. Okay, well, what do you say? I say, you know what? We've been talking to people throughout the neighborhood, and a lot of people, your neighbors, are talking about housing, education, you know, there needs to be something done about the traffic problem over at 9th and High. I don't know if any of these are issues for you, but those are the kind of issues people are talking about. What do you think of those issues, or what issues do you have? And then people at the worst will say what they think of those three, and 
it gives me a platform to then go deeper into them about what issues they feel are important. But once again, never be confused that our terminology is something that is that works in English. Or that when we say issues, when we say campaigns, when we say that means almost nothing in the colloquial you know, way in which people understand the world. That's <coughs> subculture talk. That's organizer talk. And so we need to be able to relate in a way that people understand what bothers them, what's an issue in their terminology. Uh, oh, okay, you're going to be buying. The, uh, I mean, the short answer is we understand, as I said earlier, that many of the things we're talking about may seem to be passe to people. Mm -hmm. Because that's sort of, you know, the, the punditry that's coming down about what action and organizing is about. But in fact, we have found no change in attendance or response in Canada or whatever. And, you know, around the world, I mean, this is where I get embarrassed. We, we <laughs> I trained uh, organizers uh, for a group we work with in Indonesia, and they were having an election for the governor the state of Jakarta for the first time, and they wanted to have what to us would have seemed like a sort of a not much of an action. They wanted to have a, a, a meeting where they invited the candidates in who were running for governor and try to pull out a crowd, and I committed I would loan them an organizer. Okay, so how many people do you want at the meeting? Oh, we're hoping for 10,000. <laughs> not going to get 10,000. <coughs> work with the organizer, let's do everything we can to try to get a thousand, which would have been fantastic. So we had 20, 30 people we trained as, as to do the door knock and they ended up calling rappers. So you hear all this Indonesian talk and then <coughs> rappers, so it was fantastic. So, you know, okay, here are all the rappers to be trained. Anyway, the long and short of it is, they have the rally, I reach out to the organizer and say, okay, so how do we really do it? So we had about 1,500 to 2,000 yeses, 7,500. So then I'm saying, okay, well, dial back the expert. I mean, here I'd all of a sudden put my experience in the U.S. or whatever onto Jakarta, and it had no bearing whatsoever. I mean, I needed to look at what was on the ground there. Not so. I just think you have to be careful about expectations. We find that uh, around the world in organizing, the numbers haven't changed. It really is whether or not people believe you can be effective. If they really believe the organization will act, and we go through victories we've had. I mean, we're not, once again, this is not just throwing it up against the wall. This is what worked here. This is what happened. This is what worked here. It may not happen here. It depends on how big you get, how hard you fight, and what you do. But if those things come together, it's amazing what can happen, and, and we've got you know, stories we can tell. Yeah, so just a quick contribution. I think this is all really organic, because in London, and throughout the country, there are people mobilising and campaigning on big issues. We've got this campaign, that campaign, and it, and what they're planning on doing is all coming together under a London umbrella, which organically will move into a bigger movement, hopefully mobilisation. I believe in the old way of doing it, the 60s, 70s, it's been going on for long before No, the we started talking about the 60s and 70s, we're well, just killing this yeah. potential organisation. No, 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 but I think it would be great, in my ideal, it would be great if all these organisations in this country are planning to come together under one umbrella, could affiliate to Acorn yeah. as a long-term view, uh, you know, so that's what I'm thinking. I'm going to tell you how to find it, this won't be hard. But, <laughs> yeah. Once again, trust me on this, and I don't like to say trust me about anything, but I organized in the 60s, it was hard. Yeah. I organized in the 70s, it was actually hard. <laughs> uh, I organized in the 80s, 90s, now. So I've never found it was just add water and stir and the crowd showed up. I mean, yeah. To me, it's always been hard work. And originally when I got into work, I thought, hey, you know, I'll just do this for a couple of years, and you know, it's like revolution was in the air. Was, I mean, I've already been honest. I started, you know, organizing against the war in Vietnam, then I went to organize welfare rights, and, this, and then I went to Acorn. I thought, hey, this is a sprint. We're going to make it. This is going to be a revolution here. Well, it's a marathon. <laughs> and uh, it's just always hard, and I think it's hard now, but if you do the work, you can have results. If you don't do the work, there is no spark out there, there is no magic, 
and somebody was saying, brother of an occupy or whatever. There, you know, there was a, a crystallization of energy in action. Now, can you sustain that without an organizational basis? Very hard. But could you turn out people at some level around the world? Well, it turned out, yes. I think you, you couldn't deny that. Did it have resonance? Wait, I mean, it boxed way outside of its weight claims. I mean, the whole notion of 99% or whatever has become part of the political conversation of our times. But now to do something about it, that actually is hard work. Phoenix, well, well why can I remember your name? I don't know. It's just a miracle. <laughs> Um, well, is that your real name, Phoenix, or is that one? Um, you know, in some ways, number three, who convinces you they'd stand up is also subjective. That's an, an analysis you'll have to make as an organizer. That's why you're paid the big bucks, actually. Um, elders, that is objective. You can tell somebody's old. <laughs> But how, how do you use these different factors to determine if somebody's really a leader? Yep. The point about if they're willing to take action. And which one was that? Well, I think it was, it was linked into the vision idea. Okay, vision idea, action. Okay. Let's just say that's, that's true. <laughs> I think the key is the action. Someone can be all taught, can be incredibly charismatic. In fact, I don't even think, I take vision back because I think that sometimes a leader can lean something that wasn't their vision. It's actually character traits. If they're able to kind of get onto something, they like something, they just naturally lead on it. It's because, and that, you can only tell that through them actually doing it. And then it's objective. And they're leading on it. Well, you know, they've managed to get 10 followers. Well, who am I to say you're not a leader? Okay, I'm going to pull one point out of here, and maybe exactly what you're saying, not, but I can't underestimate how important determining leadership is based on seeing if they have followers. In fact, the most common definition in organizing for a leader is someone who has followers. Because that, you can determine through tests objectively whether or not somebody actually has a base. How would you determine that? How many people they know, who they see you frequently. So even if they have a network, friends, family around them. Well, for I'm our purposes, sure you, you would be able to determine, say, influence or power or some of these other things, whether or not they could get their relationships, their contacts, their base into a meeting. Mm -hmm. If they can't, that doesn't say that they aren't very valuable to the organization, but it does say something about whether or not they're a leader. Yeah. So that's a concrete example. Like you don't have to be like, something amazing. So I met this woman who had set up her own like breastfeeding support group in the area, and she'd just done that because there wasn't one. And so she obviously knew the people who came to it had been really successful. They're her followers, and they're the people like, yeah, this is a good idea, I'm behind it. So I know that she can introduce me to other people. And she's the one who made it If she understands that what you're talking about relates to what she has. And she has a, a very niche group of followers. Sure. Yeah. So whether or not that converts into organization action, it may in some cases. Education, security, you know, it may not in other cases. But yeah, that's a one way of testing it. Because uh, that, I guess, would fit into this past experience. And certainly, if they've had past experience in leading something, you want to find out if they had a base that you can convert. Uh, well, we were doing a project in Barnet, the people who I would sort of think of as the community leaders who we needed to work with were basically people in established uh, positions of privilege. There were people with their constituency attached to them. So there would be a, uh, a parent who's the head of the parents' association, and there would be a, a rabbi who's got a um, sort of religious constituency that, um, that he had influence over. There was um, a lady who's the head of a business community, and so she had a lot of pull there. And so, and, yeah, and, and there was local campaigners and there was local politicians as well. And so these people were known and they had positions that people respected. And if you could get them to uh, buy into what you were doing, they tend to pull a lot of talk that a lot of the community would. But really, you're testing to see if that's true. If you remember something Paulette said this morning, she talked about the fact some people who have a reputation as community leaders have a reputation mm. without 
a following. That's not to say they never have a following, but in some cases their following becomes that network of meetings they constantly attend and you get separated from your base. This happens in democratic organizations regularly, which is why people lose elections sometimes in unions, in community groups, or whatever. If you're looking out and not looking down or around where you are, that's uh, a democratic prescription for failure. Let's, let's talk more about this charisma thing and how people how people try to define leadership qualities and whether or not that's useful for an organization. Who had mentioned charisma? Was that you? <laughs> so, talk talk to me about how what what uh, and the natural definition people have of leaders is defined by the media and everything else is a very charismatic view. As organizers, frankly, you have to not trust that. Because how people automatically, in a knee-jerk way, identify a leader is not, you have to have tests for leadership. Because you're a steward of the organizing process, not the chief assistant to somebody who wants to be the leader of that community. You're building a democratic organization, not a platform for an individual. There will be people who want to attach themselves to an organization or even if you're not building an organization, a cause or an issue or whatever. Um, and we saw this recently in the first organizing committee meeting they put together and the first organizing drive they tried in Edinburgh with, with Acorn and Scotland. And I can't remember if I told the story already or not, I may have, but the first organizing committee meeting all of a sudden way past the, the people they identified and had yeses, they had 40 people show up. But what happened is somebody saw the organization building. They had a base on a particular issue that had to do with security in their one part of the council housing. And they essentially took over the organization on that one issue. Their, their interest was that campaign that they were interested in not building an organization. They already had an organization. So because the sort of meeting got hijacked in the very beginning. They sort of set back the entire organizing drive. They had to sort of start over and they just, you know, 40 people, they were overwhelmed. That's a very difficult problem. Right? The more you can test people with work and observe as an organizer those relationships, because once again, that's the role of the leader. What's the role of the organizer in that same process in dealing with leaders? Dave, what do you mean by that? Well, are you a servant? Are you their support system? Are you their enabler? Are you their gopher? I mean, what is, in this dialectic we're talking about, whether it's your system or mine or no system at all, exactly what's your relationship with these leaders? Are they your, in my system, they're the boss, which is why we're very careful about the democratic process, because I work for those leaders. In your system, I'm not sure what they are. Go ahead. Um, All right. I, I, I would guess that my role as an organizer with a leader would be to keep them on point. So there's a story and there's got to be a strategy attached to that story. And leaders can be charismatic and they can have egos and they can go off point and they can hijack and they can do things for their own ends. So perhaps my role as an organizer is to keep them it's a very frank and interesting point, and obviously controversial, right? I mean, so, colleagues, I think it's a, being an organizer is a very tricky position. In fact, any sort of senior staff person in a democratic organization has a tricky position. Um, you probably have to try and manage the leadership in, in a respectful sort of way. You have to be aware of what's happening. And if you think things are going bad, you have to voice that, even if you get sucked. Because there's no, no point staying if it's all going to pieces because the charismatics are nutter, always taking you in a terrible right-wing direction or something, which you'd have to quit anyway because you wouldn't want to do it. So, But how do you define what that, that line I is? think you have to have your own judgment, and then you consult with people who you respect, who are in the leadership of the organisation, you have to intervene. Because if you just say, oh well, it's all democratic, I'm just, I just wait for my instructions. 
well, it's, it's, uh, there's no responsibility, you're not taking any responsibility. Having said that, it's extremely difficult because you are supposed to have it run, run itself. And in fact, you're supposed to work yourself out of a job, really. Well, you well, let's, yeah, now you're opening yet another door. We'll come back. <laughs> but I think it, you have to take some responsibility and, and see how you can intervene. And I'm trying to push you on what, how you define that responsibility. Your judgment. In and what's the judgment based on? The same way we have Absolutely. judgments about leaders, what's the judgment based on how an organizer looks at this accountability issue that all that's defined? Observation. Observation of what? The leader and, and what they're doing, if you think there's a problem with it. Or, or the committee and how they're, which, way, which direction they're going in. So when you start thing. working with that leadership group, how do you define what your role with them will be? You tell them, hey, just to be clear, when it comes to accountability, I'm on you. I'm going you know, to draw a line someday. Well, how are you drawing that line? Maybe I'm not saying, but I'll know when I, you know. Yeah. So I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, pick on this, but I am trying to make a clear point. I think, as an organizer, you have to be clear with leadership about your role. And you have to be clear what defines those tasks about whether or not you can serve the organization or not. Uh, and I think you have to be honest about that yeah, yeah. and transparent about that. Okay, a lot of hands. Purple. <laughs> I'm actually not purple. Oh, what color is that? <laughs> wow. well, see, now we have a language difference. That's what it's smart. If that's not purple, okay, well, pink. Right. Two chefs, two chefs. See, I'll learn as many names as I can, but not all. All right, my name is Irina. So. Okay. Sometimes you do explain what your role is, uh, people feel very free to interpret what it means. And it not, may not be what you think they understand. So sometimes you have to uh, reiterate a lot, of, many, many times, what it actually is in every single situation that you come along to. Also, you have to be very, very transparent and honest what the process you are introducing is and what role this person can play as part of this process. And what are you saying, being transparent, what are you saying would be that role? Well, I agree with everything you're saying. Now... Well, let's say it's when we're talking about house meetings or starting a process when you, you are bringing people together, you have to explain uh, that at the beginning people will have to set up certain rules that everyone agrees upon how this group is going to work, what are the aims of it, how they're going to achieve it, and everyone has to agree towards these rules. As a facilitator, uh, the role of the, organiza the organizer would be to remind sometimes members of what they agreed upon, so they direct the process, uh, not, not taking away from the people, rather than just Making sure it follows through. Interesting. In the, in the back, you had your hand up. You still have something? Yeah, I was, was going to say, facilitate that. Helping people on top of. Would you to please think more closely about your role and what you're doing and how to define that? Because there will be problems with leaders if you're, you know, fuzzy about what your role is and what your relationship is. Is that what I wrote growth. Uh, busted here in bad penmanship. <laughs> that, that's a shortcut for the organization being as large as it can possibly be. You don't need somebody like me working for you if you're not committed to having the largest mass-based organization as possible for you to build. That's as simple as that. So in the agenda we have this role thing and it's you could need a vote on that sister. Yeah, I hear you. Boy, that's a great idea. There are these three options, don't you? Probably need to bring that to the members at the next meeting. I mean, is that then a normal thing for them to expect me to say? Absolutely. Because I, you know, that's what I've defined. I protect the structure. I'm a mechanic on this car with you, but it all is based on membership involvement. That becomes the touchstone that always goes back. I'm the democratic reminder, if you will. There's a limit to, hopefully, there's a limit to them getting the majority, you know, them continuing to grow. And at every stage, they're going to have to be voted on on a national level. <coughs> yeah. 
Certainly they couldn't spread the problem, Paulette, past that jurisdiction, but there's also a process of struggle. Just we're talking about ACORN. If the any level of leadership decided to be undemocratic, they lose the ability to lead in that group. And then the next level of leadership takes over the governance of that organization to reestablish democratic control. So there was always clarity about the fact that there would be a struggle, you know, and not to say you're going to win them all, but not only would you not let it spread and infect the whole organization, but you would actually contend with that. It's not, you know, Alinsky's position about, hey, you know, I built the organization and whatever, you know, that's, from the time I built Acorn, that was one thing we were always very clear of. That is something I would never say, is not take responsibility for an organization you built. What kind of, what kind of organizer is that? I don't have any defense for that. And so we don't do that. But, so I believe that you are as clear as possible about the role of an organizer. You know, because I think it makes, part of the principle I always use in all the work is that you want to organize against conflict. So there's always going to be times when there's internal conflict in an organization. Where you can tell this Edinburgh example from the first time they told me about <coughs> Skype, I said, unless we're able to talk to that leader and get them on program, we're going to lose this group. Just to be clear, this is that leader is taking this from you. Nothing you can do about it unless you're able to get back to enough of those people that you can reassert the, the president. And it was very difficult to do. So sometimes you lose. Okay, so that's a homework assignment. Tighten down your clarity about the role of the I think we're beating it to death, right? We're okay? <laughs> so let's talk about issues. You're out there listening. You're hearing lots of good stuff. So, here are the kind of issues uh, we've been involved in. There's a big thing we're doing that has to do with remittances. People know what a remittance is? It's a money transfer back from you to your home country. It's particularly popular in, mig in immigrant, migrant communities where uh, a tremendous amount of resources go back to the home country. And it's also not regulated well in any single country in the world, which means that there is it's a massive flood of predatory activity. The Western Union and MoneyGram are the biggest parts of it, but, uh, you know, it's a mess. Isn't yeah, Mexico's second biggest income-generating activity? It's either second or third, and in many places in Central America, Honduras, Guatemala, whatever, it's even higher, so, yeah. I don't think people realize how big it is. This is uh, some of our leaders in Canada and elsewhere organizing uh, on these issues. Talking to people, got the clipboards, whatever. These are actually, this picture here is one of the, uh, the shelters in one of our neighborhoods that we organize in the ITO area of New Delhi. This is our head organizer argued if you wanted to build universal power, I hate to put this bullet in your gun, but I just take a note on this. If you want to build the most powerful organization in the world, all you need is a solution to three issues that are virtually everywhere, any neighborhood, anywhere in the world. Loose dogs, <laughs> bad drainage, and bad garbage pickup. There is no neighborhood, the worst slum in the world, the, the most expensive neighborhood, where if I'm talking to people at some point, I'm not going to hear these issues. And if we just had solutions for those, if we were better community organizers and we had a program on loose dogs, better sanitation, and, you know, drainage problems, we pretty much rule the world. And I bet those are not the issues you expected to hear about. There's a lot of, uh, you know, community organizing, you know, it's about stop signs and speed bumps and blah, blah, blah. 
why do why are those issues important? Because they affect everyone. Speak up. They affect everyone. They affect everybody. That's what I'm arguing. But when you're listening for issues, and we all, um, I think we've established all of you are listening for issues. What are you listening for about an issue? Passion. You say pattern? Passion. Passion. Patterns. <laughs> we work with you. Build those relationships. Get some passion in your life. People are going to join your organization. I don't know why. It's nothing to do with the neighborhood. But they can hardly wait. It works. Uh, right. There are three things that have to be ingredients in all issues, just to keep this in mind. They have to be specific. <clears throat> Ending poverty. I'm passionate about ending poverty. <laughs> what, what are you going to do with that? It's got to be immediate. Nobody is going to be surprised you spent the day with me thus far to see this word on the. Because if it's something in the by and by, if it's something the Lord's going to solve, if it's something you can't do anything about, it's, and if you don't think it's immediate, the organization is designed to deal with it with some sense of urgency, that's not an issue. Really. That's just a beef, a gripe, a grievance. That's just, that doesn't cut it. And it's got to be realizable. <coughs> and what does that mean, realizable? Yeah. Yeah, that means you can win. So, as an organizer, you, as you're listening for issues, if you want them to be useful in building an organization, a sense of action, a sense of, then you're sort of listening about whether or not those issues can get some passion of this. Now, that doesn't mean passion is not important. People can feel very passionate about a lot of issues, but whether or not those are good organizing issues, not necessarily. You have your hand up? Very smart thing. So now, have they won yet? No. Is there a dream act? No. Is there a dream bill? No. What happened was finally here in 2013. We were talking about us as organizers giving people options, that our position as an organizer is actually to be able to take a step back and look at will that small win lead to something bigger or will it go against the overall picture? Well, and in that case you might have even argued that perhaps that wasn't the best target. Yeah. I mean, there are some there's some issues that either aren't worth the energy or in some cases are unwelcome. I mean, people's success in actually moving a newspaper, I mean, there's nothing more unaccountable and more arrogant than a newspaper <laughs> or almost any media. Paper. So, 
you know, everybody I've ever worked with has wanted to go do an action on newspapers or TVs or somebody, and, uh, you know, for 50, 60, 80 years, however long I've been giving this advice, I forget what number we ended up with, um, but for as many years as I've been giving that advice, I've said, you know, why don't we go kick somebody else's ass? I mean, why not kick somebody else's ass? It's not going to kick us. Because there's no way to win. They will get it. But regardless, that's an interesting point. I wouldn't have gone, I wouldn't have made that conclusion to it. But you give options, they're not always right, which is why you have to do assessments later. Every strategy and tactic has to be evaluated. And after every action, you have to look at how it impacts your overall strategy. You can't just put your head in the mud and say, this is what we decided, this is where we're going to go, and we're going to keep hitting our head against that wall until it breaks green. You've got to be a little more flexible, dude. And it's impossible, though, to, to understand exactly what action exactly where your actions in take a group or a campaign at that point in time. So surely it's looking for the small and achievable goals and then reflecting on them and, and changing direction all the time instead of, for example... Well, it's important to have a theory of change as well. I mean, you have to have some sense of what action will provoke what reactions and other pressure points. So. One thing to keep in mind before I go into what I'm going to go into is you have to always make sure when you're talking about tactics that the tactic is appropriate to the target. So let's say they're raising the rates of your local power company and people are upset they don't want to pay more for electric and gas or whatever you have. So if you were trying to get 500 people to go hit on that rate issue, you wouldn't go to the uh, meter reader, would you? The guy who's going by the neighborhood or a woman who's going by the neighborhood just reading the meter. I mean, it wouldn't be appropriate just to sort of amass in your neighborhood to go after those two or three little people because they really don't have much to do with that policy, do they? So that would be an inappropriate tactic. It would be shooting a squirrel with an elephant gun. It would be you try to balance the tactic to what you can produce and the target but to have a tactic that fits the target you're trying to go after. At the same time, if you're going after the head of the uh, utility company, you wouldn't walk in and fly people in a petition necessarily either and think that that's going to somehow, it might start the campaign for you, but you're not going to believe that that's a tactic appropriate to win. You need something bigger. You need to build up to that point, right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And it's a flexible kind of world. I mean, you can't, as you say, you can't guarantee that every <coughs> thing people decide to do will absolutely work as intended, but you at least try to align them appropriately in a sense of tactics and strategy. Okay, so what's the difference between tactics and strategy? A pretend campaign that means more to you than utilities. That so what's up? Utilities is quite good because at the moment all of the uh, utility companies are, you know, massively putting up their prices, um, and everyone's complaining about it. Okay, I'm stuck here in my own right. Waterloo. Okay, okay, I'm with you. So we already know in utility campaigns don't hit the meter reader. Let's go. Okay, so you have your organization. It has a certain number of people, or you have your team, or your constituency, or whatever. <clears throat> What's the chance that you can hit them directly one on one and win? Not very big. An L freezes over. Huh? An L freezes over. It's that same date. It's the date you're going to have land ownership. Okay, that, that's true here in England as well. So let's say the chances are very minimal. So, classically, what do all organizations, unions, community organizations, whatever, try to do in order to win a campaign. They essentially try to mobilize other points of leverage or influence against that target. So what would those include? We, we have a scheme where lots of people get together and all switch to one company. So, we have put, sorry. so say we all go down there with power gen or whoever it is and we take our business away from other companies. So we're sort of saying, you know, you didn't give us what we wanted, so, <coughs> so that, And you really have a choice? 
Yeah, you can choose which energy yeah, you want. Yeah. There's tons. Yeah. It's not a real choice, because there's not a lot in them. And everyone's still suffering from fuel poverty as a result. It's not a real choice. No. Okay, but that's a tactic, right? Yeah, so so let's, you know, let's keep that in mind, which is you know, moving the base. But just on this picture, so what are other points of pressure you might be able to impact on the campaign to put... Your to local create leverage. Yeah. Your local okay. councillor, if you get your local councillor to take part and you get <coughs> then maybe your local MP, so you get politicians involved. Okay, so councillors. There's a government, there's a regulator that is supposed to help create the free market. No. Regulator. <laughs> How about allies? We got any allies on this? Yeah, it's like Age Monsoon. Who? Age Monsoon. Other organisations that would have a... Yeah. And I'm, somehow I'm not hearing the first word, age? Yeah, yeah. Age, 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 age. Concerns. I'm just, you know, we just don't have that where I'm from, so I have no idea. You know, it's like, all of a sudden, I'm hearing another language, age, I, I think they're called Age UK age. now. Age, age concern. concern. They're called Age, age UK now. Yeah, they are. Yeah. It's a charity. The so campaign's called the CFA charity. charity. I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> So various charitable interests that might share in common. People that deal with the elderly, people that deal with whatever, whatever. Yep. So it's like campaign groups have one called Fuel Poverty Action Group. A really shocking fact is that 35,000 people died last year due to fuel poverty. That's old people, people who basically couldn't afford their heating because these six companies have prices up. The other one to apply pressure we've had success with over years is going to annual general meetings. People buy a share or something, go in a suit and then they'll ask difficult questions and then sometimes get up and occupy the stage or the banner or whatever and make all the other shareholders aware that this company's opportunity too much. Right? So although Paulette has instructed us not to sit in at the Guardian office, is there any way we can move the press to help push our issue against the target? They love it. Direct action, press release. Somehow. And we're just identifying. How about our? How about unions? Do they have a common interest with us here. Yes, sometimes unions have more power than this little old community group. in two of the most powerful energy company workers are in one of two or three unions. They're very well unionized. And they may have more credibility if their membership decides to also agree with our position. If they, if we're able to dialogue with them and they don't agree, they could actually hurt our position, but it's, you have to have those conversations to know. Do you ever got uh, non-payment on there? These are all kind of pressure things rather than people actually taking action by themselves. One of the most hilarious and uh, unproductive actions I ever did was fighting a a gas company in Arkansas in, I don't know, 1971, 73, something like that. They were trying to raise the rates because it was during that sort of inflationary period for utility rates. So we couldn't figure out, we didn't have a way to move. They were a monopoly. You don't have any place to go. So we declared a shut off Arkla Day. And we were going to hurt them by everybody. It was winter. I forgot to mention that. Just not using their gas that day. <laughs> Yeah, they're still smarting from that, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. It's important to have imaginative tactics. That doesn't necessarily mean that every imaginative tactic is a good one. That's it. But we certainly saddled up and did it. We got a lot of press, and I, you know, I bet they didn't even measure the bleep that we didn't get. I mean, people boycott their gas, you know, that day. Show them. <laughs> the, only, uh, the other great campaign we liked, we did like that was around 1980. We did an anti-inflation campaign. Inflation was a big problem around the country. We were starting to organize a lot of states. We had about you know 20 different states organized. So like that, we're gonna go after inflation. It's a little bit like ending poverty. We didn't win that. <laughs> so we did have enough sense to get out of the campaign. But, you know, was it specific, immediate, and realizable? Oh, it was immediate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is a, a, this basic kind of schematic was actually developed by a guy named Mike Lipsky, who's a professor in political science and 
MIT a million years ago, and it was a model of how tenants and other powerless groups create campaigns to try to win, including tactically rent strikes and non-payment campaigns and moving. Um, having the ability to move people, that's very interesting, but the volume is huge. So uh, one of the things that's always true about tactics, and I'm sure you've heard this before, is that the threat is always more powerful than what you can deliver. So it's one thing to say you're going to move everybody. Maybe that has some impact, maybe you can create some leverage. But then if you have to actually move enough people to hurt them, you better be careful about that. That's a little bit like the anti-inflation campaign or boycott our club day. We certainly wish we never had to go through those actions because we couldn't really hurt them. In fact, we then hurt our cause in a sense. Now, we still won, but the problem, one of the reasons why utilities are bad campaigns is that when they want a rate increase of, say, X billion, winning becomes you only get, say, 250 million in increases. So, it's very hard to build an organization when you're trying to explain to people you just won because their bills went up, but not as much as they might have won. And that didn't mean the membership didn't want to do that campaign. It wasn't important to them. But frankly, those are campaigns that you say, oh, here we go. You know. So back in those period, we won a huge number of utility campaigns, but the winning was always winning some and losing some. Well, that's what politicians do, isn't it? Together, this architecture. Suppose you try and analyse some of the work you've got already. You know what the uh, what the issues are, what the people actually want to achieve, what the end victory result might be, and then how you implement those strategy and tactics to apply pressure at certain <coughs> points of the um, the power structure to actually create some change. Uh, to get media involved, and you know, get enough people taking action over, and you know, maybe try to, s to find a certain amount of time where you can achieve a certain level of, you know, of your aims. Okay, so let's, let's pull pieces out of there. So, to win a campaign, you have to know who your base is, right? What's the constituency? Who's impacted? Who may be able to be part of that earlier schematic that I we call that drawing, that, that mess that I just did, right? Timing and sequencing on campaigns are critical. So, do you have forever to win a campaign? Once again, you need to be immediate, so something's got to happen soon. How does timing work in a campaign? You're, here's an example that you're not involved in. So, if you're uh, working for a labor union that has an issue, or, and you, your members are contemplating a strike, you want to go out and strike from the brothers as cold as it can possibly be, or warmer. That's a sort of simple way. Most people don't, most unions don't like to be trapped into a you know, winter strike. If you're, they'll leave you out there and take the <coughs> So you look for when your opportunity, the vulnerability of the company is highest and your base's ability to act is also highest. So you're looking for an alignment of those things. And in sequencing, so in timing, you're looking for it to be compressed. Pretty much if you haven't won a campaign, your first action to the last action you have sequenced within 90 days or so, you need to recalibrate the strategy on that campaign. Campaigns don't get stronger month after month. They get weaker month after month because the conviction and belief of the membership is reduced and the conviction that they can win is diluted. So, you have to, as an organizer, advising that leadership and the rest of your team, be very, very concentrated on how you can get some level of impact within a time frame that keeps the membership engaged and growing, not frustrated. I mean, once again, I guess I'm on the other side of losing, but not frustrated to make a lose, and therefore the members vote with their feet. And members, constituents, or whatever, by voting with their feet,
as you see less people coming, people are voting with their feet. Doesn't say anything about their commitment to the issue. Doesn't say anything about how deeply they felt when they made the decision. But it does say something about whether or not they think it's worth their personal investment in continuing to act versus what they think they can win at that point in the campaign. So timing, I think, is very important. And then sequencing is obviously what you then structure in as actions within that time frame. People with me at all? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sign a light, just a check. A little pulse, a little heartbeat check here. Okay, so this is heavy stuff we're involved in now, huh? So this is just a sober crowd. So, can you have a meeting every day? Do you go to meetings where the members say, maybe we should be about this every day and, you know, get together and adjust the plan? And if so, what do you say? It's too much. Realistically, that's a good idea. There's a lot of things to discuss, but I just don't think we can get everybody together every day. Does this not depend on the urgency of the action? No, folks, Sometimes. Theoretically, I'll say okay, but practically, people can't meet every day. You know, um, and the more you try to push an everyday meeting, even an every week meeting, the more you're going to be running against your numbers going down. Because everybody will make the same assessment you do. In the meeting, when you first did it and you had 100 people, if you have 120 people next time, that'll mean something to people. If you only have 30, that'll mean something to people. So the burden for you is still keeping gas in that engine so that, that you're still moving. If all of a sudden people say, hey, you know, it's urgent, we've got a lot of decisions, have a leadership meeting, have a small meeting, do a conference call, do, do something, you know, cut your wrist. Don't let people meet every day. Because, I mean, you just can't maintain, you know, if you're at a workplace, that's different. People are in that job, they're already showing up, you can meet at lunchtime. I mean, but in a community setting, it's hard to get everybody back. This was also very difficult uh, if you if you watch closely, and obviously I did. I thought the whole Occupy thing was fascinating, but that was another good example of over meeting. Um, I, don't, I don't think I need to even go anywhere for that. So sequencing how many meetings you want, how many actions, what it takes for you to have a predictable number that seems to be momentum building. Because once again, you're trying to keep your people in action and you're trying to convince the target that the power of your action is increasing. So you're having to balance these, these two things. Either one that falls out of sync, you could all of a sudden be critically jeopardizing your, your chance of winning. And these are true if you're trying to stop loose dogs or win living wages or whatever. I mean, it's just a matter of scale in the campaign. Timing, sequency, your ability of your base to move are the key ingredients everywhere. Yo, I'm passing one point from our years of meetings. It's really important to actually know when you go around action points, who's actually going to do what, and then come back to it another week or whatever and say, has that been done? Do you need more help to make that happen? Because sometimes you can talk about things over weekly meetings and three or four weeks later it's like, didn't we talk about that before? Who was going to actually do it? So make an action point, who's doing it, and come back to them and ask them if they need more help and make that action point happen. Yeah. And, and meetings, you know, it's really good to have meetings, but having concrete actions that people go away and do make people feel more empowered to achieve those actions. Well, and frankly, limits. I mean, there's... A once again, I can't prove this statistically, but there's almost like a magical moment. If you let a meeting go past hour and a half, you're going to have you're going to have problems. Yeah, I'm telling you. You're going to have people start walking out the back. You're going to have some people get cranky because they thought the meeting was going to be over. You know, people get whack. So if there's a meeting. I mean, I've got a. I'm not only looking at the clock. I've got an internal clock in my mind. As it gets closer and closer to 1:30, I mean, to an hour and a half in that meeting. Boy, I'm doing everything I can to get to the leadership well. Let's you know, wrap this up. Let's get this on. <laughs> you know, whatever. Let's. So what we do is at the beginning of meeting, we ask the group, is the group happy to meet for one hour, or we can extend it to an hour, 15, an hour and a half, and then put it on to another week's business. 
because exactly we found exactly that over an hour and a half people get tetchy tired. Oh, yeah. These are tricks, everybody's got them, I think, you know, but just pay attention to the fact that once again, in the same way when you were doing the door, if you ask for 10 minutes, make it 10 minutes. If you ask people to come to me, it's only going to be an hour, it's only going to be an hour and a half. Be honest about that. Be true. Make sure you've enforced it. Make sure that even if the leadership votes you down and members say, let's go another half hour, if you helped organize that meeting and promised people it was going to be that, make sure they saw you delivering on that promise. Make sure attempting tenancy. Central housing policy seems to dictate that should last about a year. Obviously, there's a bit of flexibility around that. After a year, you're going to get put into a secure tenancy and you're going to have some tenant rights. With the redevelopments, regeneration happening all across London, what's what I'm seeing happening in West Hendon, and this is anecdotal at the moment on the estate I'm working, is that the people that are non-secure tenants on that estate have come from other estates that are being redeveloped. So they get moved from one redevelopment site to another. So as that development site gets these beautiful houses built, the rich people come in and buy, and those temporary tenants get shifted to another shithole. So houses speak, get yeah. built, they get moved to another shithole. And this, so these temporary tenancies, I've got some people on the estate that have been temporary for over 10 years, and I've got people that have been at five redevelopment sites. So what does that mean for those people? It means a hell of a lot. <laughs> In terms of access to schooling, training, employment, family connections, community, everything big society is meant to represent. And what does it mean for those communities on that estate They've never had non-secure tenants until this redevelopment started to happen. And as soon as the redevelopment came about, the, the, those rooms started to get used for councils to place non-secure tenants in. So my impression, and this is my personal opinion, is they're being used like pawns to move into places that other people wouldn't inhabit. Um, for the community, that means you've got constant transient population, so getting any kind of community act action happening is almost impossible. Okay, we got it. Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. So, what would be the first question you'd ask about, that, about this particular issue and how to construct a campaign? How many people? Um, it's a third of the estate now, so over 200, about 230 people. Uh, how does the rest of the estate like, feel about the situation? Uh, it's a mixture of, uh, it's one of those ones where you talk to people, the secure tenants, the freeholders, the leaseholders, and they say there's an issue with the secure tenants in the estate because no one will invest in any community activity because they know they're just here temporarily. Mm -hmm. And then there are people that <coughs> actually empathise with it and see that it's not their choice either. And it's actually one of the empathisers that is leading on the campaign. Mm -hmm. Are there any politicians or councillors or something like that that are aware of the issue and support work for these non-secure tenants? It's Barnet, maybe. But <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, they're all conservative. Yeah. What they yeah. care about is the property boom. Yeah. Um, any, so, so there was a councillor who, in 2009, promised that he would turn at Lisson Rising 111 of the non-secure tenants tenancies into secure tenancies because of the impact it's having on the estate. He then became an MP and the council said what he said was no, nothing to do with us even though he was a representative of the council at the time. So they're not <coughs> holding to anything they've written or any verbal or written promises they made. And so one of the questions I asked Paulette is what are the rules? What are the rules or regulations on this? So I've looked at the Barnet housing strategy and I've looked at um, sustainable housing strategy, which is what they have, and I've looked at... But who governs this, these... Well, I, I'm, I'm new to this, so I'm trying to pick out where Barnet have the right to step away from central government strategy, if, if they even do. And if Barnet have a strategy where their long arms manage... It's pretty yeah, common for about five years. Yeah. Is this also a camera, or just a regular camera? Yeah. And then you've added inside this yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.
Outstanding theorists, not only in the United States, but globally, on this are Dick Cloward and Francis Pivot, who argued in a very influential essay in, in the Nation magazine in the U.S. in the late 60s, that what we needed to do to build power, particularly for economically depressed areas, for lower income people, was not necessarily build organization, but build disruption. So they argued, for example, they were very close friends. They were also strategists for the welfare rights movement. So rather than doing benefit campaigns like I described, they thought you do benefit campaigns because you did mass enrollment for welfare recipients, you might be able to break the bank. So what they're most well known for is the notion that on entitlements, do you, have enti you know what entitlements are? Is that a common language here? No. In other words, those are rights-based benefits that everybody has to get. You're eligible for X, everybody has to get that. doesn't mean in the U.S., entitlements are triggered by individual action. In Canada, and I suspect in the U.K., they're automatically delivered in many cases. So in the U.S., we constantly are organizing to access fully entitlements. The only newest, in, the newest entitlement in the last 30 years now is the Affordable Care Act, or as it's known, Obamacare right now, which doesn't provide the kind of health insurance you have, to be like, you know, a dream, but in, involves private insurance companies, a mandatory system where everybody either has to buy that private insurance or be penalized and paid fines of up to two and a half percent of their gross income, no matter what that level is, during two and a half years. So, for example, our union has a contract right now to increase the enrollment in Obamacare in Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas, which are some of the most contested states where there are huge numbers of people eligible, but at least in particularly in two of those states, Louisiana and Texas, the governors want to run for the President of the United States, which means they're running against Obamacare. So they're trying to stop us. We're trying, it's been a fascinating campaign. But the theory on disruption would be if you break the bank and everybody who's entitled actually gets a benefit, that the financial chaos will force them, and this was, was Fran Piven and Dick Lauer's theory, that would force them to increase the benefits. 
Well, unfortunately, what we've learned in the last 40 years is if you even get close to the bank, you'll reduce the benefits. Who would have thought? But the whole point was you have to disrupt the system. So they were less invested in breaking the bank than they were arguing that organizers, because they lobby people like me and people like you all the time, that our mission should be not necessarily building organization, but disrupting soon. So for example, the program that was most similar to what you all are doing now, that was in the US, was originally called the VISTA program, Volunteers in Service to America. So you got a certain amount of money, you made a commitment of one to two years, you were assigned to various nonprofit agencies or community action groups, and you got very little training. I'm not saying you probably got more training than any VISTA ever got, but you got some little small amount of training. So essentially, you swim, you swam, or you drowned. I mean, you were out on your own. So a lot of the welfare rights organization was built off of disenchanted businesses. People who were out in these communities all over the country, who were dealing in local housing projects, dealing with low-income people, kind of in some cases were dealing with welfare recipients who were trying to get on, creating grievance, you know, sort of social service gone bad. They couldn't really win, but they were trying to be helpful. <coughs> Many of them migrated to helping as welfare rights began to grow, helping build welfare rights groups. So when I was working in Massachusetts, probably 90% of my staff of 25 organizers, probably 20 of them, were actually distant. When I started ACORN, the first 10 organizers I had were all VISTA volunteers. So basically, I would go to their meetings, go see them if they were in the bar, talk to them, and I basically, hey, you know, you're making a lot happen. Doing good, you're making change. How's it going? You know, we're building this thing, Acorn. Maybe we could help out. Maybe give us a hand. You've got some extra time. Well, they start. Maybe okay. Yeah, I'll come by and help. We'll do some doors. You get on the door. They start working with an organizing committee. They're actually working with members, building an organization. Boom. Next thing you know, I can get everybody. But I got 11 of them. So the staff is sort of me and. These 11 people who I convinced to give us some time to help build the organization. Well, that was common in building. Cloward and Pippin argued that the most change we made in welfare rights and pressing the system for change was actually by recruiting vistas to increase enrollment throughout the country where people got their rights and, and achieved the entitlement, even more so than actually building the welfare rights organization and the benefits and whatever. I can't settle that argument. Obviously, I don't totally agree, just I don't totally agree with that. But it's important to have the merit. Disruption is a potential power. People argue, and a lot of what is tactical about winning campaigns is whether or not you can change what the status quo is, whether or not you can disrupt the the pattern and flow of what normally happens, either through the bureaucracy or for a corporation or whatever. So that maybe that may look like a tangent. I don't think it's really a tangent. I think I, I'm pretty transparent. You can probably tell where I'm going, you know, from yesterday. But flower and given disruption. Now, there are other kinds of power. Let's talk about political power. How is this? Okay. Oh, Go ahead. No, I'm with you. I was going to say the right to withdraw your neighbor, which hits um, uh, corporations and businesses very hard. Um, and the right to withdraw your neighbor. Well, that's um, kind of disruption as well, yeah? Okay. Certainly, a first cousin to disruption is. But I don't know about the UK. Strikes are almost non-existent in the US right now. Uh, what's the level of strike activity here? It's, uh, it's actually gone up in the last couple of years due to the kind of government. It's in long-term decline. Yeah, it's not but compared to 30 years ago or 50 years ago. You know, strikes as a weapon for labor have become less and less in the US, particularly because you can be displaced from a strike. I think you have a better law here. But yeah, you don't have to technically have a Section 7 right to strike, too. They also you mean absolutely you mean have the right to, huh? When you say displaced, you mean sacked. Yeah. If you destroy it. Yeah. That's legal, isn't it? Absolutely. It's legal, right? Yeah. Here's something you can pretty much take as gospel. If it works, it will make it illegal. <laughs> <laughs> Any tactic you develop that works, 
you can start looking at the clock, there's going to be a time, there will be every effort to make that tactical legal. In that case, at what point do you start breaking the law? Well, you know, to change these mm -hmm. unjust laws, do you, is that part of, obviously that you must have been involved in that sort of thing, <coughs> about changing unjust laws? Right. Or is that, sorry, maybe we're going off. No, no, no. This is all part of the same. So it's all about power, right? Yeah. For actions, there's a reaction. We build power, we find effective tactics, things that are helping us win. There'll be a pushback to do that. When we were doing, uh, here's, here's a good example. So we started in 1996, almost within current memory. We started doing, we found that there were laws in particular cities that allowed you to initiate a petition on the ballot which we could use, there hadn't been an increase in the minimum wage for years, that we could use to create a citywide minimum wage. So in, at that point, um, the minimum wage was $6.15 in the U.S. So we proposed in Houston, it'd be increased to uh, seven seventy-five, dollars and we also did the same thing in Denver. So this was our first efforts in living wage campaigns. So it was a citywide basis. We did it in New Orleans as well. But in New Orleans, we didn't go for a number. We went for one dollar over the federal minimum wage. So plus one dollar. Okay, so here's what happened. We lost in Houston two to one. We one handily. These are nonpartisan elections, not party based. They were, you know, anybody could vote. We won throughout every lower income working precinct <coughs> and ward, so the third ward, fifth ward, young. You all wouldn't know Houston if it bit you, but anyway, whatever. So we won in our turf. It actually helped build the organization in our turf. That's not to say losing builds organization, but it actually helped our base. But we lost. In George Bush's father was president of the U.S. at one point. There was a particular neighborhood called Lake Oaks that he lived in in Houston. We lost in that particular precinct something like 320 to 1. So I've often said that to this day they're still looking for that one person. <laughs> they voted for us. But, you know, it was a very class-based issue. Denver, we were winning, but at the end uh, we lost about 3 to 2. Because the industry at McDonald's out there with our people door knocking, our yeses, whatever. We won in New Orleans, but in each of these cases, the hotel association, the restaurant association went behind us to the state legislature and had the votes at the state level to change the law to take away the ability for anybody ever in the future to put a wage-based initiative on the, on the ballot. And not only there, but they did it in... Florida, I mean, they did it in some 15 other states where it was legal, but it wasn't legal. Was that fair? Corporate democracy. It's actually the way power works. We had certain power to put it on the ballot, even to win the election in New Orleans. Elections were won, we won in San Francisco, they didn't take it away in San Francisco. We won in Albuquerque, they didn't take it away there, but we lost other places and we also lost the ability to even do it. Actions have reactions in organizing when it really has to do with power that you're trying to build. It's not even winning, I mean, our friend Paulette was <coughs> worried about what might happen, but she is at least accurate to know that there are real stakes, this is not a game. There could be consequences and pushback, which is why there has to be an ongoing commitment to that campaign and to struggle. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So clearly we weren't, in Acorn's experience, we weren't adverse to being involved in political action. From 1972 forward, we started both running and endorsing candidates including our members. Part of how we understood power, in fact, the motto of ACORN was the people shall rule. In other words, if it's a democracy, the majority should have a majority representation. So our members would run, we would actually work with them in elections. Most of these were nonpartisan elections for school boards or city councils or 
or whatever, but we won in many jurisdictions. And we had the majority in places from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and many places in between. But from sort of the mid 90s to 2008, in every two year cycle, we started massive voter registration campaigns. As I've said, you have to actually physically register. There's an effort by contending parties to block registration, to say you move. You're talking about tenants who move around. Well, if you don't file a change of address, you don't get to vote the next time. You may not even know that until you show up to vote that you're no longer qualified to vote. Same so they would, huh? Same in this country. You have to be registered to that address to get the uh, that voting card, you know. So it's always a push and shove. You know, we're, we're losing some of our people. We have to get them re-registered. We have to register new people as they become eligible. Uh, our constituency of lower income people don't vote as aggressively as higher income people. So we may have the numbers. And this is part of the problem of numbers equaling power. But unless we can <coughs> activate them across the board, that doesn't, that's a latent power. That's not a, an actual power we can get people to, to live with. So we started, we started by registering like 200 grand a year, and we worked up by 2008 to where we were registering more than anyone else. We were registering almost 1.5 million new voters every cycle. Hey, how are you? Well, America's a big country. The U.S. is a big country. It's got enough to change an election. Right, Dave? I don't know. I mean, some of them started to think so, because we had, of course, in the 2000 election, we had the problem in Florida, where Bush, Bush and Al Gore, and the Vice President Gore, went for weeks and weeks, months in fact, contending who had enough votes to be elected. And finally, the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the U.S., kind of gave it to them. You know, it's a, sort of a controversial thing. He sort of lost the election, but he got a, he got a freebie on that one. So, he didn't sort of lose the election. He did lose the election. See, I'm just trying not to make people <laughs> wallow in it. I mean, hey, you know, we don't win every campaign. I'm trying to keep it positive, Oregon. <laughs> so going into 2008, the Republicans thought they had this guy, Obama. This is going to be a close election. It could come down to the wire. It could come down to Florida, Pennsylvania, Ohio, whatever. So in their strategy for several cycles, 2004 and 2006, they had filed election complaints against ACORN with the, with the Federal Election Commission as well as on the state level to try to argue that there was something not according to Hoyle about us registering so many people. Now, What became the issue was, let's say, they found several cases where Mickey Mouse had registered. Everyone knows in the United States that Mickey Mouse can only vote in Orlando, Florida. <laughs> where he doesn't know where he is. You can't vote in Arizona. You can't vote in Ohio. So the truth is, if Mickey showed up in any of those other precincts, St. Louis, to vote, and it wasn't Orlando, he, could, he couldn't vote. Same thing for the Dallas Cowboys. They said that the whole Dallas Cowboy team was registered to vote in Nevada by April. The Dallas Cowboys can't all vote in Las Vegas. They all live in Las Vegas. They go to Las Vegas. But I mean, you know, so. We were clear about that, but is that, so they argued, the Republicans, this is voter fraud. Well, what voter fraud is actually if you go to vote illegally. That'd be if Mickey Mouse didn't vote in Orlando, but voted in St. Louis. That's voter fraud. Mickey trying to, you know, some joker writing Mickey Mouse on their form and turning it out in St. Louis, that doesn't really add up to voter fraud. But what's the law? Because somehow the law is important. If you give us a voter registration form by law, we have to turn it in. We don't get to decide where Mickey can vote. That's actually up to the election commission. So even if we have a stack in 
St. Louis, if we're giving them, you know, 2,000 valid forms, and we're giving them 23 of them that look like they were signed left-handed or the wrong, you know, same ink, or somebody might have forged them or whatever, we put those in a stack. These are 23 we don't think are good, but you better look at them. Well, maybe Mickey was on that list, so all of a sudden it's a big hullabaloo. But that's politics, right? So they would argue ACORN was involved in voter fraud. At the worst, it would be voter registration problems. And in some cases, like I say, even the election commissioner would say, yeah, they turned in the ones they didn't think were good. I mean, so maybe they got hustled. Put you back in. So you have 2008. The Republicans then believe it's going to be a close election. It could all come down to Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Florida. All areas where ACORN had large organizations and massive voter registration efforts. So they started arguing in the six weeks, two months before the election in 2008, oh my God, this thing ACORN, it's out of control. I think I mentioned I left the organization after 38 years, June 2nd of 2008. So we, we knew this was coming. We actually had a debate. We've gone through all these challenges the years before. Should we even be involved in voter registration? There's no such thing as registering a million and a half people and having zero errors. They're going to be, going to be wise guys. There's going to be, you know, people that you know hustle us. They're going to. But this is our job. This is what we have to do. We did it. We went ahead, and went through. We paid all this money to have people double and triple verify, call, all, did everything we could to get a clean thing. But nonetheless, they were coming after us. In the actual debate between McCain and Obama, McCain, you know, asked one question of Obama. This is the biggest example of voter fraud ever in the history of the United States being perpetrated by ACORN, and what are you doing about it? You know, Barack Obama. Well, you know, here you worked for you know all these years to build this mass organization that's involved in all these things, and there it is. It's a question on the debate. I wasn't sure they were being too positive about it. It didn't seem to be. There was no applause line here. Although I will say, it's a funny thing about the world. I got an email from someone in Korea and who we worked with. And they were so proud. They were watching the debate. Did you, did you see it? Wait, Acorn was mentioned. Yeah, it was a prideful point. How did Obama respond? Threw us under the bus. Oh, uh, he did? Yeah. How? What was his words? Uh, you know, he tried, you know, it's actually in this video, one of these videos I have. But, he sort of shrugged, like, oh, come on, it's not the worst thing, you know, but it was more like, it's not the worst thing you ever heard, but, you know, certainly we don't, we're not in favor of voter fraud. I mean, Obama's problem was he'd actually been a lawyer for us on some voter registration cases in Chicago. He'd been caught in sort of one of those, somebody called it, a little flipper McGee, he said he'd never done anything with Acorn, and they had pictures of him showing up at Acorn meetings, and, we endorsed him, and he'd been a lawyer for us on voter registration campaign. So when he said he'd never done anything, he'd actually done something, and then when you got your foot in the, you know, it's a problem. But that wasn't so. They weathered that storm, but then a year later, in 2009, as this, you know, after Obama was elected, for whatever reasons, I'm not saying it's racism, I'm not saying it's polarization in the U.S., there really became a pretty concerted campaign to always delegitimize de Obama's presidency. So surveys of Republicans after the election, after the election showed that some 62% of the Republican voters interviewed believed that Acorn had stolen the election for Barack Obama. Now here's the good news. They've done the survey every year for the last five years, and we're now down to only 52% <laughs> registered Republicans believe that Acorn actually stole not only the first, but also the second election for Barack Obama. Well, that was hard to do, because in 2009, they started doing these, these sort of scam videos where they showed up at the housing program, Acorn Housing Program, to try to establish that Acorn housing counselors were giving people advice about how to get homes and 
uh, we're getting, they tried to claim that we were giving people advice on how to bring in under age houses of prostitution that we would help them get to a housing program. So, now it's, it's come out that these were doctored videos and the filmmakers have actually had to pay fines to some of the Acorn people that were suggested. But the strategy was, and it's become a playbook, the videos come out. So on Fox News, one after another, day after day. So we now think that they were in maybe 15 offices. They tried to burn three or four offices, Brooklyn, San Diego, uh, Baltimore. Comes out in Fox, and then the Republicans introduce a resolution, a non-binding resolution, to defund Acorn. Well, Acorn itself didn't get federal money, so at one level, it's sort of, so what? And uh, but so they tried to argue defunding, and the way they wrote it was so broadly that they included <coughs> service employees, <coughs> AFL-CIO, random nonprofits in D.C., and sort of anybody who was all of a sudden an affiliate of Acorn that was barred. So we'd won bank agreements, for example, to, you know, to force them to correct uh, payday lending and other abuses. Banks were going through the, the grease at that point, getting hundreds of billions of dollars of bailout money. Citicorp, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, we had agreements with all of them on the result of negotiations to solve campaigns we've been working on. They are, their lawyers, in fact, said they couldn't make the payments to Acorn because they now wouldn't be able to get their bailout money because they would be part of this resolution. Every year from 2009 to right now, there are now some 18 different times they've put defunding resolutions about any kind of expenditure going to Acorn. The leadership and staff who managed the organization finally pulled the plug on ACORN in 2010, 11 5, and tried to rebrand the organization as they called it by taking the state organizations and reforming them <coughs> as different isolated companies and trying to put ACORN as a U.S. organization out of business. That was 2010, but as recently as this spring, you know, or last a month ago, there are yet more resolutions in the continuing budget that continue to defund ACORN and all of its affiliates and associates. So, turns out this whole thing about building power, it's, a, it's hardball, you know? I mean, it's, you have to be... I mean, all of you already know you have to have thick skin to do this work. You're going to be called everything but a child of God as an organizer at some point. Um, you know, I might as well wear a red shirt because, you know, from 1971 on, there have been resolutions and half a dozen legislators trying to demand our membership list and get us to sign loyalty oaths that were never... I don't even know if there is a Communist Party, but we certainly have been asked <laughs> many times of, you know, bringing communism hell on wheels into the U.S. to this day. So, did it affect Acorn International? No. Did it affect, you know, whatever, but... Um, did it have consequences? Yes. It broke a, the largest poor people's, people's organization in the United States. In some ways, Wade, what would you have done? Somebody will ask me that. I mean, you can tell from how I roll, I would have been the last person locking the last office door, collecting the last $10 of dues before I ever pulled the plug on the organization. Um, <coughs> There's a, in the U.S. and I think probably in the U.K., there used to be in the charter of many unions that you could never kill a union as long as there were the rule of seven. I don't know if you have that. But, uh, <coughs> something like that. Well, as long as there were seven people willing to say they were still part of the union, the union was still alive. And this was originally, came out of the 19th century when you had these terrible, devastating strikes against unions where they would force everybody off the job, take away their tools and trade and whatever, as long as you had seven, the union was still alive, could rebuild and rebuild the organization. Well, I come from that tradition. As long as there were Acorn members paying dues, how could you kill a dues-paying organization with low amount of income? Well, 
I wasn't, I was gone by that point, so I probably would have said no. I mean, you take it, you hunker down, you fight tomorrow. That's, that's part of the job. But it wasn't how everybody saw that. But I say this story because for everything I've said ACORN is internationally and for everything it was in the U.S., there's not necessarily a happy ending to every story. If you get to the point where you have a half million members here in England, I'm not going to guarantee you that you've got a free ride forever. You just get an opportunity to fight at a larger level tomorrow. That's what you get. Somebody had her hand up in the back, maybe? Yeah. I was wondering from what you were talking about, how well, obviously from what you are doing, there's, uh, it can actually do your making a difference in terms of you have the base, you have the numbers, and some people feel threatened by it, that's why you get these set of actions against you, but I was wondering whether you have had any sort of issue campaigns around uh, elections where you have actually pushed issues in the campaigns. All the time. These living wage campaigns were huge, I mean, payday lending, getting generic rather than prescription drugs, lowering the, you know, I could, it's a long list, but you end up, if you do this work, I mean, we went through, had a look at targets in a campaign. Over a certain number of years, a lot of people can be on the other side of you in a campaign. You can have very dear, very close friends and allies that would go through hell and high water for you, but you have equally committed enemies that are institutional, that are powerful, that have resources, and that can hardly wait until you take your last breath. But that's what we, that's as organizers, in my view, what we sign up for. It's not a couple of year program, it's a, we're trying to build change. Change is hard. Not everybody wins in change. We're trying to build power that people can really exercise. That's not going to be applauded by everybody. Yeah. Sure. Sorry, yes, Jim. I might have misunderstood, but I want clarity because I want to be sure of what if I've heard you right, did you say that ACORN has been destroyed in America or your base has, or your organization has been destroyed by for the lead up with all this stuff on fraud and blah, blah, blah that you just talked about? Can, can on November 5th, 2010, ACORN declared bankruptcy in the United States. Right, so they haven't That's won. That's pretty close. Members that was on bank drafts or debits or whatever you all call them was yeah. transferred to each of those organizations. So. In Pennsylvania, for example, of 765 members that were on bank draft when they transferred to Action United, which was the new name of Acorn, Pennsylvania, only three people elected to not continue to pay their dues. So you had that happen in state by state. But the long and short of it is of 38 states that were there when I left June of 2008, there are only about eight of them that have now survived as ongoing organizations today in the United States. So they're, they still are alive in California. And, you know, in the legacy states, Arkansas and Louisiana, they still are alive under different names, but it's, and in each case, they have less, they're rebuilt. Yeah. That, that is, you know, it's really phenomenal to see the whole cycle over many decades of the organization building up. And, 1.5 million people raised to focus. That's incredible. It's, um, as an old friend of mine say on the protests, um, you know, when you're being effective and you're actually having some success with your campaign, you're really effective in change things. That's when the authorities really come for you and really play hardball. It looks like that's what they've done there with Acorn. There's, there's some similar law they just try to bring in here called the, it's the gagging or lobbying law. The political parties' memberships go right down to 60 or 80,000 in each label, conservative, whatever, and big organisations like the National Trust have got two and a half million members and they've tried to gag all these non-government organisations from actually lobbying affecting government rather than gagging the corporate lobbyists. But um, you know, I just want to say that's phenomenal. Well, that's also going on in the US, incidentally. I didn't know about it in the UK. I want to know more about that. But, you know, um, I sort of threw this out there without comment, but I mean, ACORN was a non-profit. It wasn't tax exempt. Many of the organisations, in fact, all of these organisations that the state organizations that rebranded, all of them became either C4s, which is a kind of tax exempt status, or C3s, or both. All the Alencia organizations are C3s, are still the C4s. They're now trying, the IRS is trying to establish that in the United States, none, no C3s or C4s can be involved in any, any voter registration campaigns, 
any get out the vote campaigns, any voter education where you put voting records out on poverty issues or environmental issues. Or, I mean, voting records are fairly common. You know, all unions do this. Um, and a number of other things that they want to define as political, where it never has been defined as anything other than nonpartisan, to essentially, in your words, gag all that array of organizations. Now, they're saying they're doing it partially around the Tea Party, but it's it's a big net and it collects everybody, progressives, you know, left and right. And in smaller language, it says, oh, they're also curious whether or not the same rules should be applied to C5 and C6 organizations. Well, C5 organizations are labor unions in the United States. So we say that labor unions also can't be involved in any of these things. In the UK, it's actually the labor unions are involved, and in fact, that's why they brought this law in initially was to target trade unions, and specifically trade unions because they're historically they've been affiliated to labor parties. Sure. Well, I'm saying, and all I'm saying is the same thing has happened in the United yeah. States. So I'm not saying, hey, you think that's bad? Here's worse. No, I'm saying, hey, what you're saying is bad, and unfortunately, I don't have any better story to tell about the U.S. Thanks for free. Right? But. We spent a whole day together, whether it's Debbie Downer, I'm not trying to like bum everybody out, I'm just saying, you know, that I just want to, once again, I want to be transparent and honest with people. This is real work. There are real stakes. It's not just, you know, social work that people are doing, solving little problems, putting band-aids on, helping this little person, that little person get a little bit happier person get a little this, a little that. These are, if you ever decide to move from what you're doing now to build a broader, deeper organization of lower income families that contends for real power, there will be, I mean, you know that none of this work is easy now. It just gets harder the bigger you get, but it, you, you also win more the bigger you get. So we won huge victories. We also, Acorn also, was beat pretty badly not too long ago. Now, I don't know if you're named after, you picked this name after Arizona or the, you know, the, 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 the Phoenix the rising from the ashes, but part of the, the project, again. yeah, you know, hey, wait, you know, you're here you are, 90, 100 years old, you must be ready to retire or something. Well, how, you know, how do you, there's no retiring this one. Because yeah. we're having one, and now, God dog it, now we got this whole thing I spent 38 years building, virtually all of my, you know, cognizant, you know, life. <laughs> they, you know, put a stake in its heart, so now I gotta rebuild that goddamn thing. So, and here we are, it's a big world, and the issues are everywhere. So, I mean, this is a. This is not something to be done lightly. It's hard to fit into the hours of the day, but uh, and it's not necessarily God's work. It's some nasty, you know, difficult, messy, you know, stuff going on to build these organizations. But it matters to build power. You can't make change without power. But about actions, there are reactions. If it's real. It's not a fabrication. I forget who said that word. I mean, I'm obviously still still pinching my feet too tightly, but who, you know, this is not a fabrication. We're organizing for it to work, and the advantage of our model or any model that really is replicable, it has to be organic. It has to be natural for people. It has to align with what people really feel and believe. That's why people do understand pain dues. They really, frankly, I've had a million of these conversations. They don't understand how their organization supposedly that they get to run isn't something they have to pay for. This is not part of any culture in the world. This is the whole notion that it's yours and you get to run it and you're the boss and you never have to put in a single rupee su, you know, peso or whatever. There's, there's no language people get. Yeah? Uh, question about paid employees. How many would you have in a particular area? How did, how did that work? Acorn, at the point I, I left, had about 450 organizers and about 1,250 total employees, including you know, the housing operation, including the, the, the 
union locals that were part of our family of organizations. So if you put everything in one big gumbo pot, and we had a year-end meeting in New Orleans, we, you know, we booked the whole hotel. I mean, you know, get all the rooms at the Sheridan right there on the river. Uh, and you'd have, you know, minus excuses, you'd have 800,000 people in that room making the decisions. You'd have what called a year-end, year-begin meeting. You'd look at the results of the last year, make the plans for the next year. Quite exciting. You know, that meeting now, you can see it on my Facebook page, is about 50 people. Was there a problem with full-timers and other organizers? I mean, a lot of organizations do have that problem and the full-timers become autonomous and they, they take over and become, become conserved and block within it. You know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, and I wish I could answer you in a glib way. I mean, clearly, Concerned by some of the senior staff who spent, you know, they may not have spent 38 years, but they've worked maybe 20, 25, 30 years, concerned for their own uh, situation as part of what made them unwilling perhaps to keep the fight going after they were attacked so uh, ruthlessly in 2009. Um, that they'd been perhaps younger, perhaps. Uh, still as you know, invigorated and with as much vinegar, they probably would have just taken the shot, hunkered down, and gone to work the next day. But that's, you know, you get, once they got, you know, 60, 70, and whatever, you know, 80, 90, 100, I mean, that's uh, it's harder for people to believe that they can start over. And that has nothing to do with what we're doing in this workshop. That's just, I have, you know, you ask me a question, I'm going to try to answer. Um, that was more depressing than the story I told you. That's Jesse Jackson, the president. I mean, this was tremendously important to empowering so many of our members. He's a former community organizer. He had great hopes. He worked very hard, registered the people. You know, we could take as much credit for the election as anyone anywhere under the sun could take. And then at the point of this attack in 2009, he really threw us under the bus. When the first videos came out, he said, yeah, better investigate ACORN. You know, there's something wrong. Yeah, I support the fact that they passed a resolution to defund it. So without any investigation, without any much, you know, anything else, he just didn't want it on his shoe. Um, so that, I think, that was really um, discombobulating or disorienting to a lot of the top leadership and the senior staff because I think some of them secretly probably thought, hey, this is our this is our our partner. We're gonna be in the you know, we're gonna be in the guest room at the White House. They're gonna invite us to the inauguration. I'm gonna be somebody. And me, all I know is how to be an organizer. So I never suffered from that confusion. I one in the back and one up front. So do the members decide and vote on the budget of each group? And therefore, do they decide, yes, we want to take an order? Do they have that decision to say, yes, but I want to keep funding the position? They don't vote on individual job. They don't vote on individual people. There's one organization. So, yes, they have to vote on the budget. They have to do the budget. But the, uh, the staff supervisory structure was parallel to the leadership, so you had to you had the right to fire the head organizer of your state, but you didn't have the right necessarily to fire a community organizer working, you know, under that person. But they had to decide we want to keep paying for organizers and do this kind of stuff. Yeah, they had to approve the budget. And if they had a problem, they said, okay, Wade, or you know, whoever that head organizer in New York was, so and so, Phoenix, guy's worthless, he's not doing the job, whatever. You got to get rid of him. If I wasn't willing to get rid of him, their job was to fire me. If I couldn't convince them that Phoenix is actually doing the job, I'm not sure, let's say that, you know, whatever, if there had been a real job based reason to believe that he was doing his job, maybe somebody had a political issue with him or whatever, they had the right to fire me to fire Phoenix or whoever that head organizer was, but they couldn't just decide, well, we want this person to just be whatever we want. I mean, they have a system they have to work with. Had you up here? Yeah. Um, 
I gotta, I gotta speak for my peeps, but in terms of the membership and leadership of Acorn in the U.S., there's not a week that goes by that I don't hear from Acorn members and leaders in the U.S. about wanting to rebuild the organization. This was not something that the members support. This was a, a you know, an oppositional funding cataclysm or whatever that just overwhelmed uh, the staff. Maybe I can survive it, maybe I, and we'll never know. But the point was, the willingness to organize and to fight continues to be strong. In some cases in organizations, in some cases, you know, trying to connect or rebuild the organization. And what I've learned from this opposition is to be even more committed to the sustainability of the organization. So, when I said for the first 15 years we were like 70, 75% dues and internally funded, well now I'm more committed to even a higher percentage in building Acorn International and the work in the U.S. that it has to be almost 100% funded. Because I don't want to ever be in a position the next time where we get, I mean, I mean, a half million members, but let's say we get to 100,000 in the U.S. or something like that, where somebody can kick the chair out from under us. Yeah. So we spend more time building social enterprises, the farm, the coffee houses, the uh, numerous things we've got going so that they're, you know, building our union membership so that we've got resources that are constituency based that can drive the organization. Yeah. And unfortunately, whether we like it or not, and to the degree organizers hate math, they hate raising money almost equally as bad, if not worse. But the truth is, unless we have membership resources that they can control and make the decisions to move, it's really hard to look people in the eye and say, yes, this is a permanent organization. And so I, I make my living looking people in the eye and having them believe that I'm going to be honest with them. And I can't be honest about building a permanent organization if we don't control more of the resources. So, and that's the hope I find. So yeah, we're 10 years into the Acorn International Project. I mean, the work we're doing now is much, it's not as fast as we'd like it to be. I mean, look, it's a big world, but what we have is what we can guarantee at some level we can sustain. And um, I think that's something that has to be part of your thinking as well, as you try to build this, that, and the other. You're only there for whatever amount of time, but the organization or those communities' needs are going to be ongoing. Paulette, is that your hand? <laughs>